came to MIT and we went to Harvard for that event and he was in the audience there, the father. That's right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon. This one. Good afternoon. My name is Hashem Sarkis. I'm the curator, director of the 17th Venice Architecture Biennale, and I'm here to welcome you to the meetings on architecture dedicated to the theme of refugees and reconstructions. <laughs> 
This theme will consist of three panels, each focusing on a very different aspect of this question. The meetings on architecture are a program that happens during the, uh, during the Biennale itself, during the six months of the Biennale. And uh, each meeting uh, highlights a theme that is a recurring question that cuts across the different projects of the Biennale. And indeed, the question of refugees and displacement, the question of war and reconstruction, which are in all of their manifestations antithetical almost to the question of how will we live together, uh, run across many projects, not only within the main exhibition, but also among the national pavilions. And we thought from the beginning to highlight that and bring out from the Biennale participants and national pavilions examples of how different architects are dealing with it across the world. We are all refugees, if we think about it. We are always seeking safer havens, opportunities somewhere else. And in that pursuit, we represent, in a way, a condition that is antithetical to architecture, meaning architecture being place-based, stable. And yet, if we look at the history of architecture and cities, they are all in some form or the other based on or founded on the idea of seeking haven from somewhere else. Cities, as Aristotle defined them, are a place where we all seek refuge and then we find society. But a place like Venice is exemplary in the way that it is set up out of different communities, different groups of first refugees who come here to s seek safe haven and opportunity and peace among them. But somehow over the years they've established a city that has managed to maintain both the image of stability but also the image of connectedness, of being uprooted and rooted at the same time. And its citizens being both Venetian but also cosmopolitan citizens of the world. I highlight this issue of all of us being refugees, not in order to normalize the violence that leads to it, the destruction that leads to us, and the displacement and disenfranchisement that leads to the condition of refugees, but perhaps to highlight the possibility of empathy by realizing that we ourselves are refugees in one form or the other, but also as the panelists today will show how uh, addressing questions of refugees and questions of reconstructions it helps highlight and exaggerate and hyphenate certain conditions that are prevalent within our lives as architects and within the cultures of our practice that we seek. Historian, Shakespeare scholar Stephen Greenblatt, who's interviewed in the film at the Giardini, has always spoken of culture as being something that is deceitful in some form. He argues that the concept of culture seems to disguise the fact that it is not stable and not pure. And if there's one thing that this theme will highlight for us today is how architecture itself can be seen and reimagined, not as a form of grounding and placemaking, but also as a place of transposition and also as a place where hybridity, interconnectivity come together. This theme cannot be more important than today. We are confronted with mass migrations and mobilization and the politics of today, especially during the pandemic, have highlighted and exposed deep xenophobias in our societies that we absolutely need to address. In order for us to live together, we have to somehow extract from the foundations of our practices, but also from the daily conditions we confront all of those fears of the other, and they are mostly highlighted in the conditions of refugees. So without further ado, I would like to introduce the first panel, which will be both online and in person. Uh, the first panel of today will be focusing on questions of refugees and reconstructions related to larger development issues, uh, with examples related to climate crisis, climate change, and how this has generated problems of displacement and how architects have risen to address those, but also grounding this discussion within a developmental history uh, through examples from the past that Viviana Dauria will present. The speakers today are James Westcott, Honorul 
Sheila Kennedy, and Viviana Dowling. James Wesp is Aga Khan Professor Emeritus of Landscape Architecture and Geography at MIT. His research focuses on water systems from the site to river basin scales, and his site scale studies focus on gardens in India, Pakistan, and Tajikistan. His water resources research includes rural drinking water and river basin planning in South and Central Asia. The second speaker is Onurul, who is the first general manager of the Aga Khan Agency for Habitat, an agency of the Aga Khan Development Network. In this position, Ono is leading the creation of a new agency, which will focus on improving the habitat and resilience of communities in Central and South Asia. Prior to his appointment, Ono has been the country director for India at the World Bank, based in New Delhi. He was also responsible for managing the World Bank's portfolio in India, valued at $25 billion. In a career with the World Bank for over two decades, he has been director of operations of services and quality in the South Asia region of the World Bank, country director for Nigeria, manager for results and learning in the Africa region of the World Bank, and country manager for the De Democratic Republic of Congo. Before joining the World Bank in 1993, he was a career diplomat with the Netherlands Foreign Service. Our third panelist today is Sheila Kennedy, who is an American architect, innovator, and professor of architecture at MIT. She's a principal of KVA Matex, an interdisciplinary design practice recognized for innovation in architecture, research on material cultures, and the design of resilient infrastructure for emerging public needs. Her work examines intersections between natural ecologies and hybrid high and low technologies in networked cities and rural global regions impacted by climate change. And finally, Viviana Dauria, who's with me on stage, is Associate Professor at the International Center of Urbanism, the Department of Architecture at the Catholic University of Leuven. Her research explores how the epistemological contribution of development aid to the discipline of urbanism has unfolded translocally. This comprises of how cities are produced through migration and displacement as part of a more general concern with socio-ecological challenges to inclusion. These are our panelists, and I believe we will be starting with Jim. Yes. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dean Sarkis, uh, fellow panelists, members of the Venice Biennale community. Um, as Dean Sarkis mentioned, uh, when we first learned about the Biennale theme of how can we live together, we immediately thought of... Uh, the question uh, of a parallel nature of how communities can move together and thereby continue to uh, 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 live together in ways that they want to uh, and in relationship to uh, both traditional and new new locations. Uh, this panel will consist of and feature several case studies indicated on this global map Three of the case studies involve MIT and ACA uh, moving together exhibit at the Biennale uh, with a focus on our collaborative project with the Aga Khan Agency for Habitat. And three of the case studies featured uh, on the map in the yellow crosses are those of Professor Dauria's Disborders exhibit, which involves the Lake Volta region, Khartoum, and Brussels. Uh, please note that on the map there are 140 smaller crosses that represent displacement locations in countries around the world at the same time. So this is a pervasive and escalating global challenge of, of how migration, uh, refugees, and planned relocation uh, can uh, travel together. The global scope of environmental migration, uh, displacement, and relocation is enormous and it's environmentally, uh, socially, and spatially complex. Uh, this global map prepared by Kennedy Violich Architects displays data from several sources, including the Global Inter Internal Displacement Database, which indicates the orange circles, and then also uh, the International Office for Migration, uh, which indicates flows of people from one location to another. And this is just in the year 2019. Uh, 
data recently updated for 2020 indicates the numbers of people internally displaced within countries approximates is approximately 40 million worldwide. The three uh, case studies in the Moving Together exhibit shared an emphasis on moving, uh, shifting from processes of displacement to voluntary and planned relocation in nearby areas to their existing dwellings. The first case study uh, is the Ile de Jean Charles uh, uh, location in the Mississippi River Delta, led by planning professor Janelle Knox Hayes, who worked with the Native American tribal communities and the Lowlander Center in Louisiana. This community lives on an eroding river channel that faces accelerated erosion and damaging tropical storms. They seek to move together to a safer inland and upland location on the coastal plains. To maintain traditional community ties to one another and to the land, and to secure greater coordination and institutional support for that process. The second case study in the Moving Together exhibit involves a community in San Juan, Puerto Rico, led by MIT professor of architecture and landscape architecture, Mijo Mazareo. She's working with the Caño Martin Pena urban floodplain community and their Enlace project. And part of that project involves community-based relocation from the existing floodplain to nearby infill locations. Uh, same community, uh, but with greater density and elevation. Coupled with that are some uh, initiatives to improve the green infrastructure and environmental quality of the floodplain so that the community can live together and more safer. And the third case study, which we'll focus on this, uh, this afternoon, uh, faces multiple hazards from floods to landscape, uh, landslides, debris flows, rockfall, avalanche, and glacial lake outburst flooding, all of them amplified by climate change in this glaciated region of the Pamir Mountains in Tajikistan. In this case, the Basid community seeks assistance from the Aga Khan Agency for Habitat to locate from its current riverfront location to an upland plateau. Uh, there, we'll hear more about this project in a few minutes. To compare these types of um, case studies and the hundreds of others underway worldwide uh, at the present time, the MIT Leventhal Center for Advanced Urbanism is developing a typology of environmental migration projects. It's part of a larger program on equitable resilience. The case study classification includes the speed of location, the distances involved, the social scale from household to larger communities, and the degree of planning, volunteerism, and permanence of planned relocation. The emphasis here and the key point for discussion of the Moving Together exhibit is that the teams are focused on voluntary planned relocation, in part because it's a challenge that's often been seen as a last resort and due in part to the failures of design and of design implementation in past projects. We believe those failures, however, can and must be overcome to support communities that are seeking to move together and thereby live together. And with this, by way of an introduction to our exhibits and the global context that they are in, I'd like to invite uh, Mr. Ono Rule, General Manager of the Aga Khan Agency for Habitat, to share some of his thoughts. Many thanks. Thank you very much, Jim. We have Honor Rule next. Thank you very much, the Hashim, um, and uh, thank you very much, Jim. Um, so 
great to be here. She wanted to be on also. I wish I was in, in uh, Venice, but uh, unfortunately, I'm in Dubai where there's another expo. Um, as you mentioned in the introduction, the Ag I'm the first general manager of the Aga Khan Agency for Habitat, and that's because it's a new agency. And um, the reason why His Highness the Aga Khan um, decided to establish a new agency is because he realized over time that uh, in the areas where the Aga Khan Development Network has focused historically, there, uh, the risks of natural hazards were more frequent, worse, and became much more of a source of discomfort and, and misery for the populations. And of course, um, as we have progressed in our journey as an agency and our thinking has progressed, we are now very firmly clear that this is related to climate change and natural hazard risk. Now, um, Jim just uh, talked a bit about numbers of refugees and IDPs, and he mentioned a number of 40 million. Uh, unfortunately, uh, that's a tip of the iceberg situation if we look at the potential for climate change related uh, migration. Uh, my former employer, the World Bank, I think very conservatively estimates that in the developing world by 2020, 140 million people could become climate migrants. But in fact, 200 million people in the world today are already uh, living in a habitat which is at direct risk of climate change that has already happened. And therefore, um, the challenge of climate adaptation, which includes thinking where people can live, is very much a challenge of today and very much something that we need to look at. Every year, 20 million are actually actively displaced. Now, when we talk about climate change and migration, people talk a lot about places like the Maldives, where the cabinet famously um, held a meeting under the, under the water to show what the future of this island group might look like. But there's actually two front lines of climate change. One is the seashore, which is very important because in addition to the Maldives, many of the largest cities in the world are on the seashore and therefore very vulnerable. But the other is the high mountains. And the high mountains, often referred to, particularly in the case of the Himalayas, as the third pole, because the third largest concentration of ice on the planet after the two actual poles. They're very different from the poles in the sense that, A, there's actual people living there, which is not the case uh, on the North Pole or in Antarctica. And B, these mountains are actually the water towers of Asia and, and, and of course, same is true in Latin America, and therefore very important. But there are also places where people live where it's extremely difficult to live. Uh, temperatures are rising faster than anywhere else. Despite that, it's incredibly harsh in winter. Mountains, other than in Switzerland, where I live, are often associated with higher poverty because they're tough places to live. Natural hazard risk was already high, is getting higher, and it's very difficult and expensive to have the right kind of infrastructure to thrive in mountains. So it's a difficult challenge, and that's what we as an agency focus on. So what, what do we try to do? We try to work according to the logic that we need to plan for a resilient future rather than uh, facilitating people moving out of the mountains. We need to m help communities be resilient by helping them prepare and respond to risks so that they're not helpless, because no matter what you do to plan, the risk of natural hazard will always be there. And then based on that, try to build a better future. Because if you've planned, if you've prepared, the population can actually think about what kind of homes to buy, what kind of community infrastructure it needs, where to buy, where to build that, how it could be safe, and to create world-class planning in the most marginal settings in the world. And that, to me, is the theme of the Basit project that we had such a, um, a great privilege to work with, with Jim and Sheila in the, in, in, in the MIT studio. It was really an excellent example for us. So our agency, on the one hand, works very closely with people to understand what they want, what they need, and to sensitize them, prepare them for the actual physical, very earthy risks of natural disaster. And on the other hand, we do GIS mapping, satellite, uh, satellite data processing, and work with, uh, I can say, some of the best universities in the world, in the case of MIT, of course, to figure out how we can bring science and top class design together with community engagement. Community engagement, of course, being the bread and butter of the Aga Khan Development Network historically. And we do that in a large number of settlements. In our case, more than 2,000, covering 3 million people in the region of South and Central Asia. 
so um, uh, really quite extensive. Now, to get a sense of that, I talked about all these aspects, but, uh, but, but in addition to that, we actually have our own weather monitoring posts to complement satellites and weather monitoring data that are available worldwide and use that to build specific early warning systems. We map the terrain to see where what could be built, where they should build, where they shouldn't build, where we could help communities mitigate the risk of flood or mudslide, no matter how difficult it is and also to improve the resilience of construction for many natural hazard-related risks. We do that according to a process we call habitat planning. And if I want to summarize this slide, then there's two elements. First is that you need to start with the population. And secondly is that you don't just engage with the population, but you need to engage with the government who is responsible in the area because Planning cannot be executed unless the government that has the authority over the area agrees with the planning. And therefore, it is more a process of engagement than a process of design. Having said that, um, it is really important to have very important elements of design in there to be successful, because otherwise the population in particular and the government also might not want to participate. Now, the Basi uh, project, just to show you a map, the most important thing on this map is a lake called Lake Cyrus. It is not uh, a hydro dam lake. It is a lake that was formed by a massive uh, mudslide about 100 years ago, a rock slide about 100 years ago that created a natural dam that dammed up the river, the Bartang Valley, for a very, very long distance, created a humongous lake. The problem with the dam is that we don't actually know how safe it is, and we do know it's too big to improve with engineering means. It's simply not possible. So the biggest risk that all these villages where you see buses in the middle are subject to is the possibility that this dam might give and the lake burst out in one go, which would create a flood of biblical proportions, honestly, which would bring the water up several tens of meters above where the village currently is. But in addition to that, Basid is also subject to heavy avalanche risk and normal, so to speak, flood and rock slide risk. And therefore, the people of Basit are very, very concerned about whether they can live where they live. Now, one logic would be to say, these people live in Tajikistan, why don't they move to Dushanbe? Or if they live in Pakistan, they could move to Karachi. Or if they live in India, they could move to Delhi or Mumbai. The problem with that approach is the numbers I started with. You've got 20, mil 20 million displaced every year and 140 million potential refugees in 2050. If you put that in the context of the type of numbers that we see for a potential current Afghanistan refugee crisis, which hasn't even happened yet, but still keeps everybody busy, the numbers are just stupendously higher if you think about climate change migration. And if you see what refugee crises do to societies, the partition of India and Pakistan, the recent crisis in Europe around Syria and Afghanistan, I don't know that we can handle that type of migration and therefore it is important to think how you can relocate people close to where they are and close to where they have their ties and close to where they actually want to build their lives. And this is what makes Basid unique because Basid, actually the people wanted to move themselves. This is not forced displacement. It would be very difficult if it were. And they managed to identify a safe place right above their own village. So that's a great plus. So it allowed us to look at um, the, the place they identified, which they in their language called the good place, to see what does it look like, what's the topography, what are the slopes, what is the watershed, what's the vegetation, how can we actually work there, how is it subject to erosion. It allows us to analyze existing conditions and understand the needs of the village and therefore give the team that worked significantly with, under Sheila's leadership with the gym on, on how to help them design a new future. It allowed us, in fact, to use our, this slide I'll skip because I don't want to talk about architecture. I think Sheila will talk to it. But it allowed us to do what we as an agency are proud of, which is to do mapping to understand what could happen. This is actually an image, uh, an, an image of somebody who is in a mapping situation. Now, what is so interesting to me is that if, we learn from this simple example of a small village that might be able to relocate close to home. 
we could collectively learn how we can manage a potential 140 million migration problem in the future because it will be a humongous problem. And the one lesson that I would like to share is that we feel that the basis for all of this is to work with these communities from the understanding that, that a simple village in Tajikistan, any girl who's born there, any boy also, needs the same that anybody who was born anywhere else. Otherwise, they'll want to move. And therefore, we thought it would be a good idea to bring world-class planning to the remote mountains of Tajikistan. And Sheila will talk about how we try to do that as a team with MIT and the support of the Aga Khan Habitat and also the government of Tajikistan. Thank you very much for now. Thank you very much, Olaf. Uh, Sheila Kennedy is next. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, uh, uh, Dean Sarkis, for convening um, this discussion and meeting on architecture, and also Jim and Ono for your, your presentations. Um, I'm going to be presenting the work and uh, design research um, that is exhibited in the Biennale in the exhibition entitled Moving Together. And I think what's interesting is that this project presents a new model for collaborative research. It brings uh, different parties together uh, to address how the community uh, in a high mountain village could voluntarily move together to higher ground to avoid the uh, climate, the multi-climate hazards uh, that, that Ono mentioned. So we have an academic uh, institution in the form of MIT and students from architecture, urbanism, and PhD programs. Uh, pro professional practitioners uh, of architecture, and of course, ACA um, and the entire ACA team, as well as representatives um, from the government of, of Tajikistan. Uh, as Ona mentioned, um, our work is uh, in this phase shown uh, here in orange. It uh, creates a series of integrated design options for voluntary uh, resettlement that are phased and scaled and actionable by the village community. Um, one that tries to respect local skill sets, local materials and traditions, and also the pride and autonomy of, of this village. Our team had the privilege of spending time in this community, um, and we proposed uh, this series of design options organized around six key challenges that the village faced in order to move itself to safer ground. And this afternoon, I'm gonna touch very briefly on three challenges those of access, water, and shelter. For this particular village in the Pamir floodplain, voluntary relocation is really no small challenge. The large white crosses indicate the existing village at uh, 2,400 meters, and the proposed new location that you see uh, to the right on an adjacent high plateau, 300 meters above. All the questions that relocation brings, questions of self-governance, economics, the important cultural traditions, and the traditions of environmental stewardship and, and deep knowledge of this land are embedded in this village and its people. And they're compounded by the difficulties of bringing people, bringing water and bringing materials up to this high plateau. To begin to address this, our design uh, research team developed a new methodology that integrated two perspectives, two different ways of seeing this place and being in this place, two modes of understanding that have typically been kept apart in the planning process. Our approach challenges the kind of typical distinctions between high and low technologies, and it finds ways to toggle between aerial uh, GIS photometric analysis and on the ground field work with extensive interviews and observations based on the daily practices of, of people in the village. Um, the drone data that Aka had collected uh, provided a very valuable data set for the high plateau. And as Ona mentioned, uh, the MIT team was able to extract GIS layers for vegetation coverage, watersheds, solar irradiation, irradiation. And this view from above was critical to gain an understanding of this vast plateau and to try to identify areas suitable for future buildable and arable land. 
This GIS uh, information, this digital datascape, was uh, complemented with conversations uh, with time spent in the village. We had many brainstorming sessions, discussion with local ACA engineers and experts, and many, many meetings and conversations with the villagers and community leaders. As architects, much of our time was spent in conversation with the master builders of the village. Stone is the most common material around the village. It forms landscape retaining walls, water irrigation channels, passive cooling chambers, grain storage structures, and the exterior bearing walls of every home in the village. Using years of experience, the stone master, Shamabe, chooses different sizes of hammers and wedges to break stones into the desired sizes and shapes. When asked if stone masonry was physically difficult, Shamabe explains and laughs, when I cut stone, I use my mind. As we began to understand the existing skills and traditions in the village, we began to also understand how they could be applied to the challenges of relocation. The high plateau is accessed every day by villagers with goats and sheep through a path shown on the left. An old car road built in the Soviet era could be repaired. We walked the shepherd's path many times, which you can see here as a faint line on the left of this photo. And we began to characterize its conditions, breaking a very large project into much smaller micro tasks that local masons could implement with their existing tools and knowledge to make the existing path safer and more reliable for the community. At the same time, we identified non-traditional equipment that could be used by the village as a sort of force factor multiplier, a community truck, for example, a small wood mill or a seed planter are attainable tools and technologies that could make a difference. The community truck could exist in could assist in rebuilding the old road, providing access and in carrying water up to the plateau. To bring water up to the plateau, we propose the use of natural forces only. We want to maximize the soil's retention of rain and snowmelt through the use of check dams along watersheds. We want to allow water from an upper glacial lake to drive an inverted siphon and build a cistern to hold the water that flows from that siphon. In these responses to provide water to the plateau, we drew upon local knowledge of existing practices in the Bartang Valley. We saw examples in other villages of how people used water transport and inverted siphon techniques. I'll conclude really quickly with the challenges of building new homes for the village on the plateau. With access, water, and ways to enrich the land for gardens, our team designed a set of multitasking community buildings with a large um, Pamiri community house at its center. I think it's uh, important to understand that the landscape over time here provides everything. Almost every material for the house comes from this landscape. When children are born, poplar trees are planted. These will be used later, 20 years later, for beams and pillars for, in order to make um, their new houses. Um, the apricot trees that you see here are used uh, for fruit and desserts, for food. They're used, they're mashed and uh, fed to animals. And they also form a kind of a waterproofing that's used in the local plaster. Everything here comes from the land. Locally known as the Chid, in the Shanghi language, the Pamiri house is considered a symbol of the Islamic universe and a place of private prayer. Built with stone and plaster, these houses traditionally have a flat roof where apricots, mulberries, hay, and dung for fuel can be dried. Apricot roots bind and secure rain, uh, retaining walls and are the uh, waterproofing material that is used throughout. Alachavo, the village carpenter, uses an old car motor to drive his table saw. The carpenter tells us that he prefers the local poplar wood since it's free, but to mill it efficiently, the village needs a larger saw, a force factor multiplier, a critical small piece that needs to be in place for this village to self-implement their relocation to the plateau. Case studies in 
Pakistan and Nepal show that the use of simple steel plates can stiffen structural connections um, between masonry and wood, providing a better seismic resistance at the corners. And with simple spooled galvanized steel wire and a bending jig, local builders can integrate better lateral stability into traditional building materials, making traditional houses much more resilient. So to conclude, we demonstrate these ideas in the Moving Together exhibition in a set of possible instructions for the implementation of a self-governed relocation. Um, these are stories of uh, attainable resources, of people and their tools and skills. Um, hope you have a chance, if you are at the BNRA, to visit this. This project um, of design research asks how communities can move together peacefully, justly, and productively with self-governance, and what the agency of design and planning can be in this process. Moving together presents community relocation as a gradient of implementation options, choices, and actions. Beginning with the tools and skills of the villagers and their deep knowledge of the land, we design a sequence of tasks that builds over time to address community needs. Strategic and actionable, this approach offers a flexible, scalable, and replicable means for communities that face similar needs to live and move together. I'd like to thank the MIT students who committed to this, uh, to who contributed to and committed themselves to this workshop, and also uh, put up the uh, website for those of you who would like to take a look. Uh, thank you, and I think I will turn it over uh, to Vivian now. Okay. Good afternoon, uh, and thank you to the curator curatorial team to, for having placed this topic on the agenda. Uh, and yes, I will indeed, as has already partially been introduced, mostly uh, present the work on show at the Biennale and actually interrogate history through, in fact, three um, case studies. So the case studies are also connected um, to the whole notion uh, that Nishat Hawan has advanced on, on border topology, which in fact is connected to the whole idea of, uh, of making borders uh, like thicker in terms of our understanding of them, what design also can do to, to kind of thicken them in social and ecological and spatial terms. Uh, and to do this basically also um, by, by really looking into um, them as more than, than a line and more than something that ham hampers, let's say, the movement uh, of categories that we've been looking at in fact today. So um, with the first case study, which is the Volta Lake in Ghana, we actually go back to a point in time uh, which is basically uh, a moment uh, when the when Sub-Saharan's first independent country, in fact, accompanies its flagship independence with large-scale developmental uh, projects, the main one being, in fact, the River Basin Development Scheme uh, that basically also led to the making of the world's uh, largest man-made lake. And we interrogate the tensions that since that moment have actually uh, come into place uh, in uh, this particular region. Uh, this was uh, a moment when 80,000 Ghanaians were relocated to 52 model townships and a number of, uh, of ideas also about then the, the kind of assets that the territory was offering and also the extractivist processes connected um, to these became very clear. One of them being in fact forests and the importance in fact of woodland uh, that is re-emerging now as, as a new in fact uh, frontier of Ghana's uh, development. Uh, the second one being, in fact, a, a whole idea about the seamlessness of, of territory and the movement of goods, in fact, around the lake uh, that is, uh, in fact, uh, not quite uh, taking place as expected. And this is a, a kind of constant, I guess, learning from history in that sense. And then thirdly, also, how basically settlement patterns uh, and also um, related livelihoods have basically clashed with what... Um, well, a lot of uh, the, the specialists called on board at the time had actually uh, in mind. And these are examples of, of also the terms that were being used to actually talk about the, the kind of transformations uh, that were happening on site in terms of unauthor unauthorized, in fact, expansions and so forth. And so we interrogate each, uh, in fact, case through three specific questions that have to do with the tensions uh, that come on board. And really, I guess what is very clear from the Volta River project case uh, and the Volta Lake as a whole is basically how there's been quite a significant amount of adaptive strategies that um, those uh, re forcibly resettled have, have put in place. 
Um, and at the same time, however, there is still a, quite a lot of micro kind of bordering practices that are at play, which don't allow, in fact, for these adaptive strategies that offer a completely other, let's say, or alternative, let's say, interpretation of the landscape um, to, to really kind of come alive. And that's um, something to, to perhaps return to uh, in the discussion. When we move to Khartoum, we are moving especially to the southern belt, in fact, of this um, ever-expanding, in fact, city. Uh, and more specifically looking, in fact, at a city that's been breaking kind of records uh, quite significantly in terms of the highest amounts of IDPs concentrated in one moment uh, in a city and so forth, uh, where also forced evictions and natural disasters intermingle and where uh, what we've, we've learned, in fact, from, from these uh, processes is also that displacement is basically um, something that multiplies, accumulates uh, in the city's history and in, in fact, many of the urban dwellers which also leads um, to quite a, quite a sense, in fact, of, of, of multiplication of what this term actually might mean. And so when we look at the questions here, indeed, we try to, to basically um, point to this particular aspect. And the case of Khartoum becomes particularly significant and interesting to understand, in fact, how moments of crisis, and I'm thinking here of the, of the devastating floods of last year, in fact, um, actually exacerbate vulnerabilities, but they also shed further light on the precariousness uh, that many city dwellers who are in this kind of accumulated uh, displacement um, situation uh, are experiencing, but also the relevance, in fact, of situated knowledge uh, in this particular case, where, in fact, after the Sudanese revolution, the formation of neighborhood resistance committees has really allowed for the processes of, of also um, well, how, how basically donors and the state have, have come through to redistribute a number of, uh, of, of resources in that sense. And so that's something that Khartoum has made quite visible. And the last case is a case that in fact is uh, the one of uh, uh, the Maximilian Park uh, in Brussels. So we move from lake to city to park, in fact, and, and a kind of surrounding neighborhood. A very um, kind of relevant um, neighborhood because it is part of, uh, well, a super diverse environment, uh, as they are uh, also today called. Uh, Brussels is again a city that's been constantly kind of been placed on, on or ranked uh, quite higher up in the worldwide classifications on diversity and where diversity is, is, is kind of a, a real matter uh, of, of discussion. Um, but at the same time, uh, also for the contested urban development of the North Quarter, because in fact, um, it's a, it's a neighborhood that grew, uh, in fact, in, the, in, a, in a marshy uh, floodplain of a river that eventually got uh, uh, canalized, diverted, and then vaulted, and is now, in fact, up uh, for uh, resurrection. And there is a constant struggle between the resurrection, in fact, of water uh, in this case, and the removal, in fact, of a number of support structures and that are actually related to solidarity networks that emerged uh, in the park. Uh, really on the, with the backdrop of the so-called refugee crisis uh, there. And so what you actually see here in this image is the, 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 the solidarity camp, as it was called, that actually emerged at that moment. And so what we see, in fact, uh, with the case of Brussels uh, is really the, 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 the kind of way in which water is intermingled, uh, in fact, with, with urban fabric and an urban fabric that is under pressure and that is really finding it hard to... Um, basically integrate matters of hospitality uh, within its structure uh, and also where then waves of uh, disinvestment and then reinjection of resources actually complicate the matter uh, despite the fact that um, there's, there's been quite a lot of learning ground or could, there could have been quite a lot of learning ground from the 1970s Manhattan Plan uh, that, that basically uh, displaced quite a lot of uh, urban dwellers already at the time, uh, so after the river quite a lot of urban residents were displaced, and now again connected to the question of transmigration uh, after, in fact, the, let's say the fall of the Calais jungle and Brussels re-emerging as one of the, the centers uh, along the migration routes uh, becomes uh, again important. So the park is basically now used as an infrastructure for many of the migrants uh, uh, and asylum seekers, in fact, that are based, uh, but is, as we speak, in fact, the park is under redesign, and so the question of, uh, what will be displaced by the water that comes back uh, is again a matter of interest, uh, I think, for this contribution. So again, we've asked the question of, uh, well, what disappears uh, and how long also uh, basically uh, vacancy can, can kind of, uh, what, well, what vacancy adds to this discussion and also at the same time uh, the kind of uh, relevance of, of, of 
active kind of citizenship through the politics of presence. Uh, that is very clear in a lot of manifestations around the park. I'm at the end, so there's three terminating slides to just try and kind of bring forward some of the entanglements between these case studies. On the one hand, between Brussels and uh, Volta Lake, the role that water plays in all this and the kind of disruptions that are generated when water is engineered that are re never really overcome. This is what we at least can see. So the memory and the trace of water endures in many different ways in the social practices that are connected to it, but also in the kind of morphologies and interstitial spaces that we can read uh, in the urban fabric and the kind of territorial then reasoning. And when we move to, uh, on the other hand, um, the whole process of giving shape, in fact, to the relocated uh, environment, then we see how basically very often forms of displacement and internal colonization uh, are very f are very reductive in the spatial uh, kind of uh, also <laughs> dimension that is brought about. So there's a process of miniaturization that is very obvious, bareness of layouts, a tyranny of critical mass uh, for provision of services, for example. And lastly, uh, the political possibilities then of the border becomes important. Here I link to Michel Agier's definition of borderland, where he, he basically advances this whole idea that a border is also a thickness that is not just about deferral, but also about encounter and political kind of engagement. And so where also we've seen in Brussels and in Khartoum, in fact, that there are real uh, kind of citizen-led uh, movements that have been very important for the resignification, in fact, of these various case studies. And with this, I pass the word back uh, to Hashem. I've been busy taking notes and also trying to figure out how to link these presentations together, which I, I think the the three first presentations uh, give us a very comprehensive, detailed view of one case study uh, in looking at it from the in, in, in kind of methodologies and lexicons that uh, Jim Wesco has developed to on the rules uh, methodologies and uh, larger practices for uh, questions of uh, climate migration. And then to Sheila's in-depth analysis of the case study uh, looking at everything from the infrastructural dimension all the way down to the corner condition of masonry uh, that need to address these changes. And what Viviana's presentation did is take it into other contexts, but also uh, cast it in the discourse of development. What I saw happening in front of us today is first a realization that even though much of the discussion about climate change's impact on architecture and urbanism tends to focus on cities and rise uh, on the sea and rising sea levels in sea areas. Uh, here we are looking at cases where we are studying conditions related to rivers and lakes, which are as vulnerable, if not more, from what we heard. Uh, we also saw very interesting changes in attitude uh, from looking at ways to address these questions around rivers and lakes uh, from being about developing hard infrastructure to much softer infrastructures from, an, from a, a need to settle the territories, I'm borrowing your language, uh, Viviana, to accepting the condition of unsettled territories uh, and the condition of movement as being permanent, as being built into the conditions of living in these uh, fluctuating conditions. And uh, also, I felt like the examples that you gave us, uh, Viviana, in relation to the examples that we saw earlier, uh, helped us think about these problems as not being concentrated in developed countries anymore, but actually moving uh, from underdeveloped countries, but moving to developed countries. And your last example of Belgium is a, a case in point. Uh, if I have one question, which is the same for both groups, but in a way I would like to ask you, Viviana, to reflect from a historical perspective on the conditions that you saw uh, laid out in the Tajikistan project and whether there are lessons from the past as you did so well in your examples that you can bring to bear on the Tajikistan examples, but also to the uh, to group uh, Jim, Sheila and Ono, if uh, you felt like the practices that you have developed around the specific case study that you presented so well are themselves movable, transferable to other settings and as you indicated in your installation, whether we could begin to compare between them and other places happening, particularly in developed countries. So Viviana first. Okay. Yes, well, it's, um, 
it was fascinating for me to, to kind of hear uh, that the story of the Tajikistan project in more depth uh, beyond what I was able to see in the exhibition. And I think, uh, well, some of the lessons have already been learned <laughs> in a certain sense, uh, because indeed um, many of the, the issues that, for example, the Volta River project made very clear um, in, in the kind of expectations also of, um, uh, of how um, certain social practices would simply follow um, the architecture uh, that was put in place or the, the idea of certain livelihoods being put in place seemed to, to, to happen in a very different way in this project. And so the whole point of, of actually, uh, and there the, the kind of details about the, the craft also of, of the house was incredibly different. And I'm just taking that example as, as one uh, key one from the, the, for example, the core housing model that accompanied, in fact, the Volta River project that was a kind of standard component that was supposed to embody agency eventually, but it was actually a very far from that in how it, it was then um, ultimately laid out. Um, there's more, but I don't know if we have so much time, so I don't know if maybe we should ping pong and hear first from James and that, Sheila. Or, that's or very helpful. <laughs> let me turn the question around. I don't yeah. know if uh, Ono, Sheila and Jim are there <laughs> to answer, but maybe we can go in that order. Ono, if you can reflect on this, Sheila and then Jim. Or have we lost them? I have no idea. No, 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 I'm there. Um, I think you can hear me, right? <laughs> so so, so I, I think it's fascinating. And by the way, Vivian, thank you for, for those fascinating examples. So, so it, can this be transported? Um, first of all, our whole logic is that we work with MIT to see whether the combination of community engagement, world-class planning, and scientific mapping um, has value in locations where you wouldn't normally think of that. Since then, we're already working in northern Pakistan. Uh, we're already working in Afghanistan. And in fact, that work is continuing even today, despite the circumstances. And we have been working for some time in India. Uh, we do believe it can be transported, although the local circumstances and the specificity of each detail will be different. But the approach um, and the combination of, of approaches, we believe, is transportable as long as we apply this in a learning mode, which is precisely why we partnered with MITs. So yes, and there's a bit of evidence that it's happening uh, under our watch, shall we say. Um, but uh, this is open source. Anybody should be allowed to, to use our learning so that we can all learn better because we need to create viable habitats and maintain viable habitat for so many people who otherwise would have to move. Thank you. Um, thank you for the question. Um, and also thank you, Vivian, for your for your examples. Um, I think that um, the um, history of modern planning and, and to some extent modern design has produced a model that is no longer viable for many, many uh, reasons. And um, part of our approach, which I think is uh, scalable and um, can be replicated, is to really look differently at a place and to acknowledge um, the wealth of knowledge that is there and to acknowledge the productive capacity of that landscape in ways that were overlooked uh, by many architects um, through many completely top-down um, planning efforts historically. And I think what is unusual about the model that we're testing, and as this project moves forward, I think we'll have a better sense uh, to see what happens and how it works, right? It's in the very early stages of its implementation. Um, but I think our model is unusual because it attempts to combine two views of the planet that we live on. One is on the ground. This is the local hyper-specific viewpoint. And the other one is produced by the digital landscape, by those data sets and by that scientific mapping, which is such a sort of strong point um, of, of ACA. And so there hasn't been many, uh, there, there, to my knowledge, there are not many methodologies that are able to toggle between these two different ways of seeing a place. Um, from the top down and being in a place and understanding it from the bottom up. So I think it's that idea that might be um, most transferable and ultimately most useful. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Uh, 
Great. Well, I uh, really uh, enjoyed all of our presentations and hearing afresh uh, the work that our team did, but then also the uh, three examples and particularly the historical perspective that um, Viviana brought to this uh, theme. And if we look even uh, deeper historically at the Volta Lake case, for example, coming out of the tradition of river basin planning and the Tennessee Valley pr uh, project that was the lessons of which some of them exported um, uh, to some extent, if, uh, you know, effectively around the world, but also with great adverse consequence. So there are some negative lessons that have been learned and Viviana gave great nuance to the adaptation processes that have happened there. There are also some, you know, unlearned lessons from the TVA and others of, you know, beautiful community development uh, aims that were kind of left behind that can be recovered perhaps to some extent through historical study. But I'd say that the great frontier coming out of this panel and also for the field is that of comparative, effective comparative uh, and applied comparative research. Um, we do comparative study all the time, uh, but doing this with a high level of theoretical and methodological rigor is really a frontier uh, for the field, uh, and the water field especially, where one has to work on multiple hazards, uh, on multiple scales, and in multi-local types of contexts, where even in the Tajikistan village example, many of the villagers are working in Dushanbe and Moscow with remittances coming back. So these kind of transnational, transregional, as well as uh, local processes that Viviana brought out in her examples as well, really um, help to define a frontier for research and practice, it seems to me, in which architects and allied disciplines can play and have been playing and can play an even greater role. Those would be my thoughts. Thank you. I realize we're short on time, but I just wanted to highlight the importance of what you've presented today in relation to what Viviana presented, is that whereas Viviana's case studies historically were very determined on having a very fixed final solution. The case that you presented today will never be presented that way, uh, meaning that it is always evolving and always engaging, rather than being a kind of a definitive, clear image of what things could be. And this openness is, I think, a very welcome uh, change of attitude, particularly in relation to such large-scale development projects, which always beg for a very specific image tied to a very specific economic plan at a very large scale. So, uh, thanks for explaining to us how challenging these questions are, but thanks also for demonstrating to us that there are answers to these questions. We'll take a break and resume with the second panel very soon. Thank you, everybody. See you. Thank you, Hashim. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Sheila, no, no, great to work with you. Yeah, that was fun. I, I
Hello again, and welcome to the second panel of our meetings on architecture, focusing on questions of refugees and resettlements. Uh, this second panel will be primarily around the Middle East region and the Arab world. And if there is a region in the world that has been generating uh, discussions and debates about questions of war, refugees, and reconstructions, it is the Arab world. And uh, we're very fortunate to have within the framework of this Biennale, both national pavilions dealing with these questions, but also participants. And we have dedicated in the Giardini one hold space to the question focusing on the Levant region. And uh, you would encourage you to visit that section if you're interested in the question of refugees and reconstructions because of the variety of approaches to the problem exhibited there. Uh, the panel this afternoon will consist of three presentations. Uh, the first will be by Malkit Shoshan. Uh, Malkit is the founding director of the Foundation for Achieving Seamless Territory, FAST for short, an Amsterdam and New York-based think tank that develops projects and campaigns at the intersection of architecture, urban planning, and human rights. She is a researcher, award-winning author, designer, and area head of art and design in the public domain in the Masters of Design Studies program at Harvard GSD. Her socially and politically engaged work has been published and exhibited internationally, and uh, very happy to share with you that, as you may know, the project by FAST at the Biennale has received the Silver Lion from the jury. The second presentation will be by yours truly on the reconstruction of Beirut, and the third presentation will be by Rashad Salim, who's the curator of the National Pavilion of Iraq at this Biennale. Uh, Rashad is an Iraqi artist and activist based in London. He was born in Khartoum, Sudan, to a German mother and Iraqi father. Salim has traveled widely before settling in Iraq in 1971. He has a sister, Raya, who is also an artist. He studied graphic arts at the Institute of Fine Arts in Baghdad in 1980, shortly before moving to London to begin his studies in audiovisuals at St. Martin's School of Art in 1983. During the years 77 and 78, Salim was a member on the Norwegian Thor Heyerdahl Reed boat expedition from the River Tigris to Djibouti. His work is heavily influenced by his travels and residencies, and these include the cultural spheres of Tunisia, Morocco, Yemen, and the United Kingdom. Salim's career involves teaching, and he also acts as an art advisor for the United Nations. He's also a junior member of the Salim dynasty of artists and a member of the Strokes of Genius project. He lives and works in England. Malkit, we'll start with you. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, the invitation and the hospitality here in Venice. Um, I'll share with you a brief presentation uh, on behalf of FAST, uh, the Foundation for Achieving Seamless Territory. Uh, what we do at FAST and with our project is we use architecture and design tools to make visible systemic violence, uh, engage with various publics, and develop counter-narratives and designs. And we use these counter-narratives to influence systemic change by challenging institutions and power structure. On the slides are images uh, of one of the events that we organized at the UN headquarters in New York this series of high and expert level events, sorry, this series of high and uh, expert level events, it keeps opening my theory, so. <laughs> um, uh, this series of meetings uh, are part of our long-term uh, research and advocacy project called Blue that explore the diverse impacts of uh, that UN missions uh, have on cities and communities uh, in um, uh, and the environment. The project includes uh, historical and special research and a series of policy recommendations. Um, I see, sorry. Um, and it was actually presented here, or elements of this project have been presented here uh, at the Venice Biennale in 2016 as part of the entry to the, uh, of the Dutch Pavilion. Uh, within the context of the post-war reconstruction or reconstruction and violence, uh, 
I'd like to share with you a few projects that I developed with FAST in the past years, centered around Israel, uh, the Israeli and Palestinian conflict, which taught us how ideology and politics are played in the built environment, and how special design is complicit in shaping all sorts of exclusionary spaces like the nation state and um, uh, other systems of violence. Um, as well as, it also taught us how to use design and its agency for resistance, advocacy, and solidarity. So a few years back, I went uh, through uh, a family photo albums uh, at my parents' home in Haifa. Deep in the drawer, uh, where the, uh, I found individual pictures that uh, didn't make it to the photo album. The photograph st uh, stood as a painful reminder of events someone in the family didn't wish to remember. In this case, it was a failed marriage. Um, here, a young, a young couple stood on the southern slope of Mount Carmel in the 60s. What struck me about these pictures was not the joy of the young family, but them standing on a pile of scattered stones, the ruins of Palestine. One of my first projects was Atlas of the Conflict, Israel-Palestine, which maps the appearance of uh, Israel and the disappearance of Palestine over the past 100 years. It presents more than 500 maps that provide a detailed territorial analysis of the conflict, which includes themes such as borders, patterns and typologies of settlements, demography, land ownership, archaeology, and cultural heritage sites, as well as landscaping and access to natural resources. It also contains a lexicon that helps complexify the maps and challenge official definitions and terms such as borders, Gaza, citizenship, absentee property laws, national parks, or a patriot. Just to share a few maps from the Atlas, over the past century, as I mentioned earlier, two uh, major processes happened simultaneously, construction and destruction. And what you see in this uh, sequence of map from 1918 and 2010 are the distribution of uh, Israeli localities and Palestinian localities. And you can see their transformation over time and the difference in the distribution of these localities over the land and the landscape. It was overwhelming uh, for me to come across this map uh, for the first time, which also ended up uh, in the Atlas. It depicts the 500 Palestinian localities that have been evacuated and destroyed in less than a decade. While some of the ruins happened during the war, the rest uh, took place after the, war, after the war ended and in a period of relative peace. The erasure of culture was in fact part of the post-war reconstruction effort. The next chapter of the Atlas identifies various settlement typologies that constitute the Israeli-Palestinian landscape. One of the spread uh, in, the, in this chapter um, uh, consists of two typologies, the destroyed village and the refugee camp. The destruction of uh, Palestinian villages and livelihood led to an international response. The first uh, UN refugee camp emerged along the borders of Israel to provide shelter to the Palestinian refugees from 1948. Already then, the newly established UN refugee agency, UNRWA, have confined more than 700 Palestinians in camps across the region. It also mentions specific cases like the Seven Stars Master Plan, which can be classified as a post-war reconstruction plan aimed to transform the demographic balance along a segment of the Green Line, which is the internationally recognized border of Israel before uh, the Six-Day War or 1967, or before Israel conquered and occupied the West Bank, the Gaza Strip, uh, the Sinai Peninsula, and the Golan Heights. The seven stars indicate the design and construction of seven new towns that are connected by a new highway and have industrial centers, parks, etc. While the master plan was implemented, a wave of demolition orders were sent to Arab localities in this area, and since then the implementation of the demographic uh, or the transformation of the uh, demographic balance have, uh, implement, have been implemented successfully. <laughs> 
The next project that I would like to briefly share with you is Zur, the letter Z, just after Zionism. This project would begin at the last page of the atlas, uh, the letter Z of the lexicon. It includes two seemingly unrelated terms, Zionism and Zoo. While the term Zionism provide a brief description of the Zionist movement and its strive to establish a homeland for the Jewish people uh, in general, uh, the term Zoo featured a, a, new, a, a news item and a postcard describing how Gazan zookeepers uh, painted two uh, white donkeys with black stripe and caged them, in, uh, and caged them as zebras. When you think of the term zoo and Zionism, or more precisely the urban zoo and the nation state, both can be traced back to the age of reason and classification and lo looking at the transformation of the donkey into a zebra from the perspective of the enlightenment period, one rather quickly realized that something here went terribly wrong. I spent a year researching the Gaza Strip in the light of these two terms and speculating about classification going wrong. We started producing illustration that experimented with the notion of domestication, of wild species, and domesticity in general. We looked at um, craft associated with uh, domestic space. We began representing our images and diagrams using embroideries and model spaces with macrame. We drew imaginary animals inspired by painting from the Enlightenment era while replacing the background with elements borrowed from the news item from, news item from the, on the Gaza Strip. The F-16, the flotilla, the tunnels, the walls replaced the church towers or the, farmland or the farmland typically found in old classification drawings. Uh, we designed soft pigeon cages and we turned the architecture gallery where uh, Zoo took place eventually because it was, a, it, it's, it was turned into an exhibition, into a menagerie, and we completely engaged with the notion of a paradox. The animals in the exhibition included donkeys, rats, and pigeons, and they were ca uh, cared for by an activist from the Animal Liberation Front. Here are some additional pictures. And while working on the project, I uh, contacted Mahmoud Baragut, the zookeeper from Maralan Zoo in Gaza City, and he joined us to the opening of the show in uh, Maastricht in the Netherlands. So elements of zoo and the atlas are um, uh, embedded and weaved uh, within the exhibition uh, that you can see here at the Venice Biennale, Border Ecologies in the Gaza Strip. Uh, border ecology and the Gaza Strip uh, traces the transformation of a small farm in Kutsa, a Palestinian agricultural village that is situated along one of the territory's most militarized borders uh, with Israel. The Gaza Strip is a dense Palestinian enclaves uh, bordering with Israel, Egypt, and the Mediterranean Sea. It's about 140 square miles and 2 million people inhabit it and it's under siege since 2007. Uh, so the project explored the emergence of unexpected spaces in response to stresses and war, and for nearly a century, fluctuation in the shape and form of the border have affected both human and natural ecologies, leading to the formation of spaces of exception, environments that at times seem paradoxi paradoxically more resilient and sustainable than those with the steadier histories. So, uh, in the past decades, the four-acre farm owned and managed by the Kudaya family in Kutsa have been attacked, damaged, and destroyed time and again by Israeli raids, shelling, and uh, patrols. And for the Biennale exhibition, we collected stories of daily life from the farm through ongoing conversation with Amir Kudaya, and I think he's listening to this presentation now, and his family, linking mundane objects, uh, produce and species such as watermelons, sardines, sands, and sediments to bureaucratic protocols, uh, Israeli imposed restrictions, and continue, uh, continued acts, uh, acts of violence. And these stories also attest to the Kutsa community continual engagement in collective acts of survival, resistance, mutual aid, and solidarity. Do I have time to share an example? Okay, so I'll share one example of the stories we uh, have in the exhibition. Uh, it's called uh, Gold for Water. 
water scarcity in the, in the region, in the, in the Middle East, is severe and will exacerbate uh, with, uh, with the climate crisis. Uh, Israel supplies, which is the sovereign power, it supplies about 5% of the water needed to sustain uh, the population of Gaza. Uh, and Gazan's life depends on uh, over-extracted, depleted, and polluted uh, coastal aquifer. Uh, contamination by uh, uh, seawater, chemicals, untreated or undertreated sewage, and runoff from fertilizer leave only about 4% of the aquifer water safe to drink. The rest needs uh, to be purified and desalinated, which is a very uh, costly and uh, uh, costly process. In addition, uh, Gazan's municipality uh, water grid is unreliable. Much of it was destroyed uh, again and again uh, during the war. Uh, the situation forces Gazan to improvise or rely on unregulated systems of wells and overpriced water through uh, private vendors. And in Kutsa, the Kudaya family has always uh, struggled with water access and uh, has therefore long experimented with uh, self-sufficient and regenerative water uh, sources. Already in 1983, the family built the first rainwater harvesting system, which included an underground water tank with a movable cover along a series of, uh, and along it was a, were a series of uh, small dams to direct rainwater to the tank. To pay for the material necessary for the system's construction, uh, Kaldia Kudea uh, sold the gold she received at her wedding, uh, and her husband, Abdel Khalim Kudaya, built the, uh, and constructed the, the system. You can continue reading more stories uh, on the website uh, uh, of the project, borderecologies.org. Uh, there are a couple of images from the exhibition uh, we installed at the Venice, uh, the Central Pavilion. And the central piece is a weave that was produced in collaboration with the Tilburg Tex uh, Textile Museum, and it is now part of their archive. Uh, it includes overlapping uh, timelines of the history of Gaza and the Kudaya family next to wars and Israeli-imposed restriction, restrictions and closures. Um, it also contain, contains personal narratives and a few uh, elements from zoo, like the pigeon and the flotilla and the F-16 as well as the tunnel that is running under the table. Um, I'll end here. Thank you very much. I can have my slides, please. The set called Recentering Beirut. The center of the August 4, 2020 explosion near the grain silo in the Beirut harbor was at 
exactly one kilometer from Martyr Square, the symbolic center of the city. If the Martyr Square statue became the symbol of the reconstruction of the 1990s, then the silo would no doubt become the symbol of the reconstruction to come. This very shift of center is more than symbolic. I would like to propose that it carries with it a potential for reconnecting the city with its vitality. The displacement of one kilometer is actually a result of a sum total of a million other small displacements that took place on that ominous day. The scale of damage and death can be explained by an overlap of two explosions seconds apart, which caused an earthquake and a pressure bomb. However, thousands of lives were spared because of the lag between the two bombs and between the four warning signals sent by a shaking earth before the pressure waves did their damage. Perhaps there's already a writer at work interviewing all those who were spared a falling glass pane or a panel because they felt the earth move and ran inside or because they tucked under the table or bed and lived to tell of the horrors of what they saw when they crawled back out. These micro miracle stories deserve to be carefully chronicled because they give this epic cloud and its apocalyptic colors much more human scale. Together, these stories describe very graphically, however, the geography of Beirut. Beirut operates like an amphitheater. The explosion, the, har the harbor being the stage, the two surrounding hills of Beirut amplifying its impact. The closer to you were to the center, to the theater, to the stage, the less warning you got, the less time you had between the tremors and the waves. However, there were also many other factors that played between the orientation, the age of buildings, what people usually did at 6 p.m., and sheer luck. Luck distorts everything. It has no distinct geography, no predictable measure between death and escaping it. When the explosion happened, the silo itself created an off-centering effect one that protected the downtown to its left and the western side of the city more than the eastern side. In that sense, the explosion, as this diagram shows, tells the story of a city that could possibly be once again in front of the opportunity of recentering itself. For the past 30 years, Beirut has been intent on building a new city center where the civil war had created most damage in the downtown even if that center had already been displaced to many places, to Ras Beirut, the very tip of Beirut in the 60s and 70s, to provide a modern shopping center, and to tens of little small centers around the city dispersed during the war because of the war in the downtown. There were many bad moves associated with this reconstruction effort of recentering. The plan here is in front of you. One of them was actually the unfortunate dissociation of the downtown from the harbor, whereas the downtown is centered around the harbor for many reasons, some political, some economic, uh, some just pure real estate blindness to the presence of the harbor. Uh, the city shut off from the harbor, and the harbor grew to the east, and the city blocked on itself as simply a real estate project disconnected from the vitality of the city. Historically, however, Beirut flowed from the harbor. This is a historic map that shows the intimate connection between the density of the city and the harbor. It's upside down because the Ottoman's tradition was that north was down. Uh, goods arrived there at the harbor, and guests would stay at caravans rise by the water, and then their goods would flow through the customs up to the souks. And you can see that graphically in the scale of the buildings here, where residents would meet them. The pulse of Beirut's life was set by ships and visitors and quarantines. Till today, more than three quarters of goods that come to Lebanon go through the harbor, but they no longer set the pulse of the city. It is not easy to replicate the old connection that the harbor had with the city, but it's still a very vital employer, surrounded by the residential areas, the transportation networks, and with strong visibility and connectivity to the country and the region. Now, it is not unusual for cities to lose their centers or for their centers to shift. They do that all the time. 
New York does it, London does it, Beirut has itself done it several times. The explosion has brought the harbor back into the picture as a site of disaster, but again, a site of attention. And it is inevitably shifting the center of the city's efforts to rebuild and its imagination to include, even if by accident, its most economic viable region. Let's think of the following possibilities as we rebuild this area. The infrastructure that blocks the harbor right now, like the big garage and the highway, could now reconnect it. A light rail line can easily traverse this area, and rail has been completely absent from the visions of reconstructions of downtown. The first and second basins, which have been traditionally part of the downtown, can now be reopened and link it back to business. The quarantine dump, sewage stations and gas, har gas harbors, which are all around the port, which are our major sources of pollution, can be rethought as part of a comprehensive public health plan, and above all, the isolated residential areas, which are just south of the harbor, can be revitalized by connectedness without losing their identity, the way that the downtown did, and without losing their population, the way that the downtown did. A bold recentering of Beirut bodes well for any further thinking about the city's planning and that of Lebanon. It connects with the cultural and economic future of the country. It shifts from a real estate and statically real estate focused project within Beirut's boundaries, such as the image you see here, to center to a new center linked more effectively with the, econo with the economy, to the adjacent neighborhoods, and to regional and global networks that reinvigorate the identity of Beirut as a port city. This new center may be only one kilometer away from the current one, but it promises to propel the city light years ahead. Thank you. Bismillah. Uh, I'm an artist and uh, I've uh, developed a, an approach that I call expeditionary uh, to address the situation that we have. And I've also come with an idea about the ark. So I'll be taking you on a little journey. I hope we can uh, travel through it. Uh, as an Iraqi, you know, we have been at the forefront of uh, a war. And uh, it'd be good to look at what these armaments that have been used actually are and uh, what this war is. So uh, this is a bunker buster that, that uh, went through a, uh, uh, a, a, um, a bomb shelter, specifically built bomb shelter, uh, with its uh, absolute destruction, 408 uh, civilians. Uh, it is tipped with uh, depleted uranium to go through that. Now, the war in Iraq has uh, affected every single sort of uh, level aspect, uh, you know, whether it is the, the psyche, the uh, cultural heritage, the environment. Uh, we've had an attack on all of these, uh, including you know, uh, historically, Iraq was the first place where, where chemical weapons were used by the British on the Kurdish. And uh, as an as a, um, activist, I was very concerned with the use of depleted uranium, which has left a, a trace within our genetic structure, an increase of, uh, of cancers, etc. cetera. Um, but what we see also is a changing in, in the warfare and the means of warfare where in which there's a gradual, or actually increasingly exponential uh, um, removal of the human in the act of warfare. We are going from, from uh, very you know, heavy structures with a lot of crafts involved towards unmanned, uh, unmanned uh, uh, vessels of, of destruction. So this, there's this isolation, this taking away of, of the human being in it, 
as well as the, 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 the non-cultural presence of the invader, if you wish, within the territory. A loneliness, an isolation. Uh, artists have been working with and, and trying to address the issues of war from long ago, for quite a while. And what we have, even in the local, an expression, uh, in a, uh, uh, some kind of expression against this war, but it's all mainly expression. You know, how do you deal with it? How do you have that? How do you engage with, with the ramifications of, the, of that war is, is uh, something that has concerned me. There have been many uh, exhibitions, international, etc., artists working together to express things. And uh, in my last uh, participation as a curator and participant in an exhibition in, in Den Haag, where I actually met first time uh, Malkit over here, uh, that was a point of, of uh, extreme depression and, and uh, uh, loss of hope on my part and many others because we had gone from a war to that of civil war with, uh, with the destruction of the Askari Mosque that we still don't know how it happened as it was surrounded by American troops at the time. Uh, but anyway, that led to a major war that I think is captured in the work of Hana Malala, an artist, uh, in her ruin technique. However, uh, I had the fortune to participate in uh, an expedition from Hassan Kif, which is at, uh, in southeast uh, Turkey, down to uh, the Chubayish in, in the marshes of southern Iraq by recreating uh, a gufa, the scoracle, and uh, uh, a kelek, a raft. And on going down, I had a, an epiphany about the ark as a boat of gathering, of bringing together rather than one entity. Uh, many things was noticed on the way. There was a complete disappearance of, of the watercrafts, of the heritage of the water. Remember, Iraq is a, a riverine culture based on, on water. And you can see you know, with uh, this painting, uh, that point of, of transition from uh, the use of wind and the water for movement to that of um, coal and then, of course, oil. And that's one of the main reasons that these boats have disappeared, the combustion engine. Uh, so there I've got this fascination with this coracle, which used to, which got to, you know, incredibly large sizes. And we had, uh, sorry, we had workshops. I had a workshop in London where uh, I was exploring the idea, that epiphany of this gathering. And having, being a circle, the coracle, the guffa, when it's gathered together, creates a pattern, sort of six around one, which we find in nature, which we find in, in, uh, in actually everywhere, and, uh, and including in, in the actual act of gathering. When you gather anything of the same diameter, it creates this pattern of six around one. It's a base of Islamic pattern, etc. cetera. And in 77, I was uh, a part of an expedition making a reed boat on a, on a journey around the Arabian Peninsula, connecting uh, various civilizations. But it's interesting that this reed boat is generic, just like the coracle, the gofu is generic, and really any of these essential primary boats are generic. You find them all over the world with uh, individuations in different places. It itself, uh, in the cross-section of the reeds that are used to build it, is the design of the boat itself. So when you look at the representation of, of uh, the Ark, uh, and we have the, the Western representation is most you know, based on the gospel and the Torah and that expression, we have to remember that the, the description comes something like 5,000 years uh, after the event at least. So there's an oral history that took that, and then you have these cultures that sort of represented in their own uh, image. The, the, coracle, the, sorry, the, the ark over here, which was built, uh, I think it was in Kentucky, costing some two million. Uh, the structures of it is, is what we are called, 17th century architecture, a shipwright. And if you look at the, the, the way it has been built, the actual structure within it, 
It's remarkable how close to the architecture of a penitentiary, of a prison is. Uh, there has been attempts to um, make a round one. They discovered a 1,500 year old uh, text, uh, BC from Babylon, Ernest Finkel, uh, but that failed as one entity. But we do know now that there was a, uh, a flood and that uh, it did have a major effect. We've got the, the evidence that uh, the, they've made studies and topographic studies of the Gulf area, uh, which would have been an extension of the, uh, the Mesopotamian uh, river valley. And that has been flooded. So it's really a, a, a Gulf uh, arc. But I began to study the architecture, the vernacular architecture that would go, have gone into the building of an ark, as well as the boats that would have been used, because it would have been a gathering. And indeed, and in the first mention in the Gilgamesh, it's turn your, uh, you know, the, the gods, or one of them, uh, suggests turning the reed hut into a boat. Gather all your, break down your, your home, and gather it all and, and uh, create a boat. So there have been uh, many studies, works, I've been recreating, working since uh, uh, 2016 in, in Iraq, returning from exile. And that's one of the main things, is this return back, actually being an expeditionary, being an explorer, searching for, for uh, things back in the country rather than being outside, which has been the major, major thing. With, uh, uh, we've been studying vernacular architecture, engaging with students. It's interesting that Iraq has no specialization within the vernacular architecture, and this has disappeared. It's changed completely the landscape, as well as no, no uh, specialization within the maritime. So we're, it's, it's exploring a way of engaging the community, engaging the universities, engaging the people in this new field, using the arc as a means of, uh, uh, of, of, that, of that gathering, of that engagement, that study. Uh, we are, with the loss of, of our uh, sovereignty and invasion, we have been open up to uh, a major uh, constructions of dams by all our neighbors. Uh, we have got uh, serious uh, water problems. We, I mean, we're not in a position to create war, but there is a water war, as well as uh, war on every other aspect. Amongst those boats that disappeared, that have been iconic within Iraqi arts, uh, from the visual and the, the, uh, the narrative to the, to the uh, abstract, and I think it's, there's a link between even the callig calligraphy, which also was uh, uh, developed in, in Iraq, Islamic calligraphy, uh, is the mishhuf, the canoe. Again, it's generic, but you find it all over the world, but in Iraq there's a very particular uh, um, history to it. We have, going back 3,500 BC, evidences of this type of boat. Um, and uh, it's, it disappeared. So I made it uh, uh, a job to, to uh, find the last, the sons, the families that used to build these boats and began to uh, study them and to actually build them. And by this finding sort of a, a, a interrelation between the generations, as well as between these boats and the environment. Uh, and decided that we could actually return these boats and use them in some manner, uh, which I'll go in a little bit later, and started using them. But the marshes of Iraq are not the only environments that have been destroyed. You've got the orchards. Uh, the palm orchards that had canals. You had canals going all the way from uh, Basra all the way to Baghdad, that's over 600 kilometers, connecting the Euphrates and the Tigris. This has disappeared, leaving one. And in the orchard areas, they have been uh, decimated, uh, mainly by the use of, um, of uh, uh, because of oil, but also the water, water uh, 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 receding. Uh, and also the rising of water. We are at the forefront of, of climate change, of, of, uh, the, uh, within a heat dome. Uh, it's a major thing, and you can see over here the actual encroachment on, on the right of the oil fields into the areas we're working. I'm working in where that loop is, which is in Medina, it's in, uh, in Basra, and Huer, where we're making the boats, is, is in that 
area. Yeah? Uh, these boats are tarred. And uh, it's interesting that, that people don't really remember, uh, forget that uh, we've been a hydrocarbon culture since ever, since before metals. We are using tars, bitumens, uh, different oils because they're naturally occurring. And these, the main source of these uh, carbohydrocarbons is in uh, Ambar, in the west of Iraq where I did a workshop to rebuild, to study and rebuild what is called the Esbiye, which was the cargo vessel that used to take it down from the Euphrates on the west and help to build things like the ziggurat of ore. The ziggurat of ore between every uh, 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 block, every uh, uh, tier, has this tar and, and, and mats. So we recreated these. Uh, and I found over here also another sort of link between the vernacular architecture. I mean, this is like wattle and daub technique in building. And all of these go into the, 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 the knowledge base that we are building, not just to revive it, uh, but to sort of, in a way, conceptually build that arc, which is, in a way, uh, a memory palace that we hope to also create uh, uh, a virtual model of. But the, what added to it was that these boats were a means of bringing people together, of connecting people and also connecting them to the environment themselves, uh, something that, that has been majorly uh, disrupted in Iraq, this link between the environment, people, and each other, including you know, children and, and, uh, and women. So one of our missions has been over here and will be to create uh, clubs. And we've already got four clubs, in ba one in Babylon, Basra, in uh, Sugashiuch, and in, uh, in Babylon. So we are, we are looking how to create clubs and how to link with the clubs in Venice, which we have been trying to do, and how to learn with, from, from each other. The, at the bottom, there's uh, clubs, and this is Doha, and actually, my, my nephew is a part of this uh, club. These are, of course, international type boats. We want to do it with, um, with traditional boats that are modernized. We'd also like to see how to, to create sort of uh, uh, expeditions, bring these boats out, bring them here. I was hoping to bring them during this uh, Veenale. Well, we didn't succeed, but we're going for 2023, inshallah. Then. But many things link Venice to, to uh, Mesopotamia and, to, of course, to the Levant, through the Levant, including the boats. Uh, we, we see that uh, the, the, they're the same sort of type of boats that were used in the marshes of, of Venice as in the marshes of Iraq. And in the high culture, in the high culture of the, the Abbasid period, we find what looks very much like a gondola. And uh, we've been also you know, engaging with boat makers over here, with specialists, uh, Gilberto Penzo, with uh, people on, on different levels, creating conversations about this. And in Iraq, we've already started to build uh, models and studies of these boats, to how to recreate them first as models and to use this as the beginning of a maritime museum that we've been invited to develop in, uh, um, in the, in the muse Basel Museum, uh, which is uh, excellent. Uh, but just to end over here, these, there's the factor of, of women. And, uh, and for, for me, I see this art, which is uh, embroidery, stitch, uh, chain stitching embroidery. Uh, there's a wedding blankets. They're called Marsh Arab wedding blankets, but they're actually used by the, uh, the pastoralists as well as the city people. And I found, and I'm, I'm working with um, a group, a feminist group, a, a women's group, who are reviving this and teaching it to a new generation. And what I found fascinating was a continuation of the iconography that you can go and find from Tel Halif and from uh, uh, Obeid period, pre Sumerian people, a continuation of an iconography into the present in, this, in, this, uh, in, these, in these blankets. So uh, we're, we're working on, on that. And these blankets also have, have been a major influence on, 
on artists, on Iraqi artists. They're sort of uh, the fauvists and, and you know, it's, it's our natural thing. We can see the, the, this connection between the arts. And I'm looking also to, uh, uh, one of the women, just as a little story, one of the women who were making these, an older woman in her, in her 60s, said that she's fed up with doing this and she just wants to do her dreams. And she started using the same technique and the, and the stuff to do, like you see, Omrassan's work over here. And uh, it's remarkable how much like Cobra or I know the, uh, these artworks. Uh, but in the end, and this is the last couple of slides, uh, it's really trying, trying to do something to give a, a life worth living for, for our youth. Uh, we've had a revolution since uh, October 2019, a nonviolent revolution. It's been squelched, it continued, continued. COVID has, has interrupted it. It's, uh, we've had thousands that have been killed and that have been taken away. And we're working on, on, on this. I mean, uh, so really, we, we need to find and create an arc for Iraq. And I hope you know, with Venice and all your help, we can do so. Thank you very much. Uh, in the interest of time and being both moderator and participant, I will not answer the questions I will ask. <laughs> but I will uh, try to also put two questions together for both of you and freely answer either one of them or both of them or come up with your own question and answer it. Uh, the first one has to do with the uh, dimension of this discussion that is at once urgent but also problematic, which is the notion of reconstruction. Uh, we were having dinner together last night, and we all saw in the idea of reconstruction a, a certain challenge because it seems to periodize per, uh, er, moments of peace and rebuilding against moments of war, whereas we all see that to be a continuum. Uh, both economically, materially, but also in terms of the kinds of violence that reconstructions tend to inspire or tend to produce. So I wanted to ask you to reflect on that, uh, but particularly also in relationship to the notion of the fact that there are sometimes big narratives related to reconstruction, big visions, big projects, and sometimes we miss them. I overemphasized in my presentation the dimension of the potential of a recentering, which does require mobilization of everybody towards one project. But the reality on the ground is that a year after the explosion, the most effective reconstruction efforts have been the micro reconstruction efforts of individuals and NGOs rebuilding at a small scale. Uh, there's the narrative of the ark as a way to save us, but the reality is that it is made out of these thousands of small ships. That's right. and the second question, which is in a way related to this issue of scale, uh, has to do with the archive or the way in which the smaller pieces can add up. Uh, Malkit, you raised the question of those photographs that you unpacked, which had been left out of the meta narrative, uh, and what they mean in terms of their suppression and exclusion. You raised the presence of certain crafts that somehow history suppressed, uh, but they are actually the more present ones, the more prevalent ones, in favor of maybe bigger narratives, bigger archives. So it's the question of the idea of reconstruction and what it entails in terms of its own violences and challenges, and the question of the scale of the narratives that we associate with the, with the story of reconstruction. I turn to you, Malkit, first. Um, I think the questions are very similar because, um, I mean, what we learn in history, reconstruction projects are often being uh, used by power structures from the great deal of Roosevelt uh, that worked, uh, that developed together with the Lyman brother, uh, brothers um, a reconstruction plan for post-war Europe. And they put already in the 40s a $2 billion plan to reimagine how uh, Europe can be part of a global market and how to reposition the US as a global power and as an emerging empire in the world. Uh, 
So reconstruction gives space, or war or shock, like the shock doctrine, gives space to reimagine the world. And uh, at the same time, in this process of reimagining the world, there is a process of erasure and neglect, or um, it can be intentional or not intentional, of other histories, other narratives of, the, let's say, of those who didn't win the battle. And I think uh, in the case of uh, these photographs that I pulled from the drawer and never made it to the photo album is uh, like a metaphor to so many processes that happened in my country that I only learned about them later in my life, well, actually through architecture, because architecture exposed the level of, for me, it exposed the level of uh, violence and uh, destruction through con construction. And what I find interesting now, uh, the way you describe Beirut, is that there is a threshold, a space to maybe start a collective project of reimagining together what the city can be before all these uh, economic forces will come in and start, uh, um, um, you know, uh, putting the thumb on many other develop uh, developments that can be positive for the city. But now we'll sort of perpetuate the interest of, the, of those economic forces. Um, yeah. yeah, I think um, this issue of progress and this issue of the urban and, and the rural, and what we, you know, wars have, have been instruments of progress as well, of development, you know, Second World War, Germany, Japan, these, you know, England lagged behind because they weren't uh, as destroyed as Germany was. So, I mean, there, there is that thing of progress, but we also have, you know, within that progress, uh, a war against or with the nature, with, na with the rural. And what, what you see in, 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 in Iraq is not only the sort of overtaking of the combustion engine of these boats, but the, the, the products of the rural communities. Uh, everything from how you eat and how you drink, uh, all the utensils, all the things that used to be produced by the rural communities for the urban. And you had finesse along the route between that. That has been overtaken by a culture of plastic and, and the ready-made, the factories. The fa and uh, we are suffering a major, major pollution, major catastrophic uh, uh, cut-off of the economies of, of uh, togetherness of the engagement within. We keep on speaking about you know, architecture as being something that is, that is urban. It's not, it's a, it's, it goes, and you mentioned this thing of the, the, the origins of, of, of these. You find all the origins that have been developed in the, in the center coming from the rural areas and from the engagement with the nature of that area, which has effect. So when we are reconstructing, on what model are we reconstructing? You know, that, that, I think, is, is really important. And, and those that are actually paying for that reconstruction, what is the vision they have of that, and why are they putting that funding in? And there are a lot of questions, like uh, uh, Malkita said, as to the, you know, the, the genuineness of, of why, what reconstruction is. So uh, <clears throat> yeah, absolutely, I think, like you, said, you, you mentioned, uh, reconstruction has to start from the bottom. You know? uh, if I can add one question to both of you related perhaps to the first panel and to what you just raised, is that the, in the first panel we saw a transition from an understanding of agriculture, as you said, as being meta-production, hard infrastructure that supports the urbanization and industrialization, to a very different attitude towards agriculture and the land, perhaps as a result of climate change and the sites of climate change being also in rural areas, the attention that they are given is for their own sake. Production for the local, uh, att attentiveness and participation of the locals to fix their own conditions, rather than to be tied in this larger meta-narrative of uh, economic development. Uh, I want to turn to you to talk about your project, uh, your installation at the Biennale, uh, because it is about agriculture. And it is about ag agriculture as a form of survival self-sufficiency rather than a kind of agriculture that is connected to this meta-narrative that we were talking about. So in both cases also in terms of the revival of certain skills in the uh, marshes uh, and the, re the rehabilitation of the marshes, whether we are witnessing 
through these practices a shift towards attention to the rural for its own sake or agriculture uh, as not an industry or a sector that belongs to the meta-narrative, but that is being transformative of the landscape itself. Now, these areas, like you mentioned, the marshes, the, uh, the idea of, of, of uh, development is towards tourism, you know, not towards actually the development, and it's not just agriculture. I mean, a lot of these uh, cultures are, are not agricultural, they are subsistence uh, dependent on the nature around. Because agriculture, again, is, is something that has a shift between the urban and the natural. Uh, agriculture wasn't invented by civilization. It existed before civilization, as we know it. You know? And I think there is, a, there is a major war happening that we are at the losing end of uh, f by this idea of civilization, the urban civilization, where that can take us. You know? And uh, the, the sort of the, the, the hierarchical the hierarchical nature that has been exponentially growing to the point where, you know, we have the whole billionaire thing, the whole, you know, the oligarchies, this accumulation of wealth, and the attempt with this wealth to actually leave, you know, sort of like a sort of like a viral ejection from the from the globe, you know, to where to we don't know, you know, uh, uh, and to hell with with what's on you know back on land. So we are facing you know climate change. We're facing uh, uh, you know, the need for, for getting rid of fossil fuels, etc. So all of these things, the, the solution is to look and have with a bit of humility you know, the knowledge base and the engagement you have in, in, in nature and, and the rural transition. Um, I think what I learned a lot from my conversation with uh, Amir Kudaya is uh, how under uh, circumstances of, and the Kudaya family, under the circumstances of such extreme crisis, you can still have a thriving community that can be self-sufficient. They don't need money. They produce their own food. They reproduce whatever they need. They, uh, it's, uh, they are dependent on renewable uh, energy. Uh, they uh, harvest their rainwater and they thrive, their lives thrive. So I think the big question is about how we can still continue living in this world and while taking into account the reproduction, reproduc uh, reproductive capacity of Earth to support life. Because now there is, uh, I mean, we are completely out of sync with the modes of production and all the infrastructure, whether it's food production industries or energy production or uh, water distribution and all sorts of resources, um, and how we go back into a different conception of what life can be on this earth, and we can thrive with much less. Uh, and of course, there you have a question of inequality and the market and all the other forces and systems that are in place now and seems extremely hermetic that uh, prevent us from actually from liberating us, from reimagining what a life on this earth can be uh, in a more just and uh, uh, inclusive environment. Uh, indeed, I anecdotally remember a researcher looking at alternative forms of energy supply through electricity, uh, actually looking at cities that have undergone major war to see how they managed to reinterpret the electric grid mm. in, at the micro scale in order to be self-sufficient. So there are lessons to be learned in many ways from that and the continuity as you described between war periods and reconstruction is beginning to be uh, <coughs> meaningful in many ways. I realize we're past our time. We have a 10, 15 minute break and we start the third panel. Lakit, Ashad, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.
Hello and welcome to the third and last panel of today's conference on refugees and reconstructions. The panel today is titled Restoration of Craft, Restoration Through Craft, and its focus is on the material culture of reconstruction and extracting from this material culture practices, social and economic habits and processes that help inform architecture and help build society through these crafts into the process of reconstruction. The panelists are George Richards, Azra Akshamia, and Elias and Yusuf Anastas. Let me introduce our panelists briefly. George Richards is director of Community Jamil, an international organization tackling some of the world's most urgent challenges, using pioneering approaches grounded in evidence, science, data, and technology. Prior to becoming director in 2020, George led strategy for Community Jamil's international programs from 2015, including the establishment of the Abdul Latif Jamil World Education Lab and the M MIT Abdul Latif Jamil Clinic for Machine Learning. He also worked on the European Social Inclusion Initiative at JPAL Europe and the Transforming Refugee Education Towards Excellence program in Jordan with Save the Children. Our second panelist is Azra Akshamia. He's, she's an artist and architectural historian. She's also an associate professor in the MIT program in art, culture, and technology, and directs the Future Heritage Lab there. The Future Heritage Lab is an art and research lab working on creative responses to conflict and crisis through performative preservation and co-creation with affected communities. Our third panelists are Elias and Yusuf Anastas, born into a family of architects in Bethlehem. Elias and Yusuf studied architecture in Paris and worked there until winning a competition to build a music conservatory in their hometown, Bethlehem. After returning to Palestine in 2010, they expanded into furniture design and research projects celebrating local artisanal skills. They are partners at AAU Anastas and the founders of Local Industries, a community of bold artisans and designers dedicated to industrial furniture making. George, you're first. Thank you, Professor, and um, thank you for the invitation to speak today, and thank you to everybody at the Biennale. Um, I'm going to speak today about craft and health. And um, as you said, Professor, the title, Restoration of Craft, Restoration Through Craft, it prompts also a third meaning of the word restoration, which is that restorative sense, the, the sense of healing that we have in, in, in English. And I'll be focusing particularly on the Iraq um, Cultural Health Fund to be introduced later. To begin with, um, your introduction probably set this all out um, clearly. Thank you, Professor. But just to clarify for people here in the waterways of Venice and in the arts world who may be more familiar with Art Jamil, which is the arts and culture organization uh, established by the Jamil family and based in uh, Dubai at the Jamil Arts Center. Um, I'm coming in from and representing Community Jamil, which is Art Jamil's sister organization and which is more focused on um, science, as you said. Um, and it is through our work in health that we have encountered the significant contributions that craft and restoration can play um, in well-being. In 2008, the um, Jamil family started to support um, activities to support, sustain, revive traditional crafts in the Arab world through a program in Cairo called the Jamil House of Traditional Arts. Um, this is in Fustat in uh, historic Cairo and is a two-year program training Egyptians in a number of traditional crafts, including, as shown here, glassblowing. Um, glassblowing is a particularly fragile craft in, in um, historic Cairo. There are only two remaining families in the part known as the um, City of the Dead uh, in English. And what really drove this, this support for um, crafts was two things. First of all, that the crafts are an intrinsic uh, form of the wider uh, family of artistic expression. It is meritorious in its own right and should be sustained and should be taught. 
but secondly, that the crafts can be an important um, uh, vehicle for the social fabric of cities, that is through creation of jobs and livelihoods, but also through the role that crafts can play in the regeneration and maintenance of particularly historic cities. Um, a good example of that is Fustat in Cairo. And another example is Jeddah in Saudi Arabia, where in 2015, uh, the Jumil House of Jeddah was, uh, Jumil House in Jeddah was, was launched uh, with a similar mandate of uh, teaching uh, the traditional crafts, including gypsum carving. And Jeddah is, a, is an important historic city um, with a uh, particularly important old town called El Belad, uh, made of these beautiful houses of coral dredged from the Red Sea, um, influences uh, brought from a melange of different places, from the Red Sea, from East Africa, from uh, the hearts or heartland of Arabia, from the Levant, from the Indian Ocean, from South Asia. Um, and, and all these uh, different activities that have been supported had, as I said, this common goal of how can craft uh, be intrinsic to a healthy city, uh, particularly a healthy historic city. And this is a theme that we see, actually, in the way that UNESCO in particular and other bodies consider craft. So in, uh, in Jeddah, for example, um, in the official inscription of the historic part of Jeddah into the UNESCO list of world heritage, the, the function of craft and the nature, the essence of the historic city as a vibrant place full of activity, of commercial exchange, uh, as a gateway for pilgrims to Mecca, um, was tied inexorably to the architectural heritage. And so craft went beyond being um, artistic expression to being intrinsic to the life of the city. And UNESCO, um, with, I would say, unusually flowery language, spoke about the fact that the city was not a frozen and dead tourist attraction, but that its once mi uh, mighty buildings needed to be nursed back to life. And, and this was very much the role of craft, uh, both in the everyday activity and dynamism of the old town, but also the role that craft can play in restoration. And put in, 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 in one way of putting it, craft as a factor of uh, social well-being. This is a, an approach that is taken, I think, in, in many other contexts. And, and again, these are some more quotes from UNESCO officials. Um, the one that jumps out to me, this is in the context of Mali, uh, where the mausolea had been destroyed um, by terrorist activity and conflict. Uh, the one that jumps out to me is the middle one by Lazar, uh, who I think is now the Assistant Director General of UNESCO, <coughs> saying that we want the community to rebuild their own heritage. It's not just about rebuilding stones. It's also about keeping the cultural significance and keeping the role that the mausoleum in Timbuktu had in structuring the life of the community. So again, this role of craft and building very much at the heart of what is the life of the community, of the social well-being. So that's sort of where we got to. And we then began to think about what does it mean, what is the role of craft beyond social well-being, particularly in situations of um, catastrophe, of emergency, whether post-conflict, whether due to climate change. And we took a step back to understand what we mean by health more generally. As good a reference of any might be the Constitution of the World Health Organization, which defines health there as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. And we began to wonder whether it could be shown that craft had po has positive impact on physical and mental well-being as well as social well-being. Um, and with this in mind, um, together with Culture Runners and the Future is Unwritten Healing Arts Initiative, under the auspices of the World Health Organization, uh, Community Jamil co-founded the Iraq Cultural Health Fund with the mandate of supporting uh, cultural initiatives designed to improve physical and mental well-being and social well-being um, and to test that, to see whether we can measure it, 
and to see whether we can build a body of evidence that will transform the way that we think about culture and particularly craft, in this case, in the country of Iraq, which Rashad um, so eloquently described its, its recent um, and, and often tragic history. The first project that we have um, focused on is actually the second that I'll speak about, which is actually Rashad Salim's Arc Reimagined. Um, but I can, I can cheat that because Rashad has done such a wonderful job of, it, of introducing it. And instead, I will talk about the second project we're supporting first. And that is with the, um, the Yazidi community of northern Iraq and, and elsewhere. Um, we're working with Yazda, which is a community-based organization. For those of you, um, well, it's difficult to forget, in 2014, the Yazidi community endured uh, genocidal attacks by ISIS, and this is a photograph taken at the time of the flight of the Yazidis from Sinjar, a major uh, city uh, for the Yazidi community, as they fled towards Mount Sinjar, where sadly many of them died of exposure and starvation before they could be rescued. Many more were killed in Sinjar and elsewhere by ISIS, and um, many women and girls were enslaved. The cultural identity of the Yazidis um, is a relatively underdocumented one, uh, little known, I would say, um, and one of the most striking um, uh, manifestations of, it, of, of the cultural identity of the Yazidis is uh, tattooing, what they call dek tattooing. And you can see an example here in this image. Again, as I said, relatively under-researched, uh, under-documented. Uh, this little page here is taken from the journals, the travel journals of a sort of uh, quintessential early uh, 20th century British Orientalist woman called Lady Elizabeth Droa, who found herself among the Yazidis and tried to begin the process of sketching what those, um, what those tattoos were, typology. But very little has sadly been done since then, and very, very little in a more scientific way. So we began to wonder whether sustaining this cultural practice, tattooing, which had kind of fallen out of, uh, out of usage, uh, it was considered by the Yazidis to be mostly a, a practice for, for older women, could itself be a way of addressing the need, urgent need for healing amongst the Yazidis who have uh, tragically high um, suicide rates and other post-traumatic stress disorders as a result of the genocide. There is um, a literature about the role of archiving itself as healing. In Rwanda, again, sadly, another um, place that has experienced genocide, uh, archiving the oral histories and traditions of Rwandans, including their experiences of genocide, but the very um, the, the very craft of storytelling was a way of addressing intergenerational trauma and addressing the mental health needs of the Rwandan community. Um, so we, this is an excerpt from the, from the paper um, sh shown there. So we are now working with Yazda, this community organization, to see whether we can document and archive Yazidi tattooing as a way of directly addressing the mental health needs of the Yazidi community. Tattooing, beyond being a historic cultural practice, actually found a tragic but important um, new significance during the, during the genocide, especially during the enslavement of, um, of many of the Yazidi women, who tattooed themselves crudely, however they could in captivity, with the uh, names of male relatives who had been killed, with the dates on which they had been taken into slavery, with places where they had been, with villages that had been uh, torched and destroyed by ISIS, partly because they wanted to memorialize the experience, but partly because they believed that ISIS would consider, consider tattooing to be haram, and therefore that they might be less likely to be raped or forcibly married. So this is part of the, uh, this, is, this is kind of one project where we're thinking about craft, in this case tattooing, and its direct role, the direct role that it can play, sustaining that craft and archiving it in uh, the mental health of the Yazidi community. The other project is, as I mentioned, and I'll keep this brief because Rashad has done such a great job already about describing this, Arc Reimagined. We at Community Jamila are very proud, along with Culture Runners, to be piloti del padiglione to support the production of the uh, pavilion here in Venice. And, and I think I've learned a number of things from, from this project. 
But, but maybe just to add one, one gloss to what Richard described, which is that the revival of the vernacular techniques of boat building have also addressed a need for, uh, for, for health, for healing, for health and well-being amongst the communities of the marshes who have suffered through conflict, but also through the degradation of their environment, of their, uh, their place of living, through the draining, reflooding, and now the impact of climate change on the marshes themselves. We see how building these boats together fosters social well-being, which is, of course, another component of the WHO definition of health. But I wonder if that constitution were written today, whether they would not add beyond physical, mental, and social well-being a fourth category, which would be environmental well-being. And the way that these boats are being built, the way that they are being made in deep harmony with the, um, with the environment of the marshes, is perhaps another example of how craft can contribute to this fourth category of health, of environmental well-being. Thank you. I'm waiting for your sign. Thank you, Dean Asarkis, for inviting me to be part of this panel. It's uh, really fantastic to be here. And um, greetings to all of you in the audience and also online. Um, I will be presenting today the project Displaced Empire, which is displaced, uh, displayed in the cohabitat section of the, in the Arsenale. It's a one-to-one -one, um, scale textile installation, a prototype made out of humanitarian textiles and discarded clothes. And the project investigates craft as a means for uh, creating a life worth living in conditions of forced displacement, but also as a vehicle for knowledge exchange across borders to address some of the points that Hashim uh, started the day with, the alienation and the politicization of refugees um, and their criminalization in uh, the rich nations that are not willing to take them in. The project was developed by the MIT Future Heritage Lab, which I direct in collaboration with our many different uh, partners in Jordan, uh, students and faculty members from German Jordanian University, um, then displaced Syrian designers who live in Al Azraq and Zatari refugee camps, and then humanitarian agencies, uh, CARE and NRC, uh, who were facilitating our work, as well as our uh, partners in the Emirates, uh, Sharjah Museums, and the American University in Sharjah. The project focuses on the Azraq refugee camp, in this case, in terms of the research that uh, is informing its design. Uh, these are some images from it. Um, what you see here is the cutting edge of the humanitarian architecture today. Um, this camp was founded 2014 um, in response to the overflow of the previously founded Zatari camp. Uh, Azraq houses more than 35,000 Syrian refugees. Zatari, on the other hand, um, around 90,000 people. These are mobile cities. Um, semi-mobile, let's say, they're about to become permanent. And all these thousands of people live in, um, you know, a sea of steel sh uh, sheds uh, that um, get really, really hot in the summer. You can imagine temperature between 50 to 60 degrees Celsius. Um, people are, you know, desperate. There is no future. The past has been erased. Um, is there a possibility to move away from, uh, from these places? And I'm not critiquing here Jordan, uh, just to be sure. Jordan is the second host country of refugees per capita in the world and continues to support Syrian refugees uh, in contrast to the many rich Western nations who could uh, and should be doing more to, uh, to support these people but are not willing to do so. So with this project, um, we experiment and communicate many different stories. One of them is through, this, uh, through the form, which is a hybrid of the so-called T-shelter, the standardized uh, shelter developed in Azra camp, 
that you see on the top left, and the Ottoman portable palace, the military palaces, these are luxurious um, uh, kind of cultural infrastructures that we hybridize here yeah, um, conceptually also to uh, poetically comment on the possibility of a displaced empire, an empire that might be happening in the future if we continue the displacement numbers as we are experiencing them at the present, uh, soon there will be more displaced people in the world than um, the sedentary ones, and what kind of world that might be, and what can we uh, learn from that um, present, which is our future, from these people who are experiencing um, forced displacement and uh, experts in survival strategies. So the form and creation process uh, of this tent represents, in a way, a visual critique of humanitarian architecture and demonstrates uh, various possibilities for a, a cultural intervention uh, in a humanitarian crisis. You see the so-called imperial banners that we show them uh, on the sides of the tent, uh, laser cut um, and laser burned with drawings which depict everyday life uh, conditions in Azraq camp. And for example, what you saw in the previous image, a cultural shelter that the man had built um, out of sand and mud and kind of stealing pieces of cement that he could find on different uh, construction sites. And for me, this image is so uh, telling about what is happening in here and, and this juxtaposition of the kind of standardized humanitarian shelter that uh, is provided by United Nations and then these, um, um, the cultural shelter in front of it, which is really talking about the cultural and emotional needs of people that are not met. Here, in this case, the sand castle references both the Palmyra Arch and maybe some of the local Jordanian cultural heritage. And uh, we could see this form of shelter as a form of critique that, uh, of humanitarian aid paradigms that consider roof and food as essential human needs. What this man is telling us is that uh, actually, culture and uh, the kind of emotional needs are also important and uh, essential. So since 2016, our collaborative group across borders has been studying inventions created by displaced Syrians in Azraq camp. You see some images here, for example, a water fountain made out of shisha um, and also uh, some plastic buckets, which you can also disassemble with this idea of possibility of reusing them in the future. So it's a kind of heritage or cultural practice that is taking place in the present, but with a possibility of creating something new in the future. And many Syrians um, humanize humanitarian aid by uh, uh, transforming with their craft and different kinds of skills, um, core relief items like the wool blankets that are um, distributed to them that you can see here in the image that are creating this kind of beautiful majlis um, welcoming environment to you know, host your family but also guests. And um, these photographs were mapped by our collaborators in the camp, both uh, MIT students and Jordanian students, as well as um, the Syrian journal team that identified those. Um, and then with MIT students back in Cambridge, we worked on reverse engineering and learning from these inventions uh, and documenting them, which you can see in the exhibition, into these different kinds of tripsticks and scenarios that are bringing these stories closer together and also uh, with the aim to document, archive and disseminate uh, them, uh, both in the camp as a kind of local knowledge, but also to speak to policymakers and humanitarian architecture des designers uh, on how, what can we learn from, from the people themselves and inhabitants of these sheds. So throughout our work, of course, ethics of collaboration have, has been always a subject and it's a really, you know, many dilemmas uh, happening here. We were trying to address them through numerous conversations, um, uh, usually multi-generational and uh, we try to do multi-directional knowledge exchange so everyone is learning and contributing something um, and also through that uh, contribute to a transcultural exchange. 
Another dimension of this project uh, explores uh, the material capacities and the kind of our role as humans uh, in a kind of global, and speaking of environmental health, uh, George, that you mentioned. Um, you know, these camps um, receive a lot of humanitarian aid, also in form of materials. And those materials come from somewhere. And you know, they might be your genes that you have discarded and where 2,000 gallons of water are used to, to produce them, um, to wool blankets and shock blankets that, um, uh, that I showed also earlier in the picture. And we are uh, experimenting with ways in which we can recycle that garbage, but also in adequate uh, humanitarian aid, for example, clothing that is culturally inappropriate and that is donated as uh, trash to these camps, to create uh, tapestries, which um, on the one hand reference, as the exhibition piece does, um, Middle Eastern textile, mobile um, nomadic architecture, and uh, textile traditions like the applique techniques of uh, Kayamiya or the Ottoman um, tents in, in this case. And you see on the right hand the interior of the tent that is exhibited uh, in the place. But instead of the traditional applique technique, we do reverse applique. So it's layering of fabrics with, to create um, a kind of certain density which on the one hand can be used for insulating these um, sheds. On the other hand, maybe pockets could be sewn into them to create mobile storage. And also you can depict different kinds of stories through patterns displayed. So you see here some of the prototypes designed by myself and my team at MIT. Um, this is not all to the project. There is another component, the process behind it, which is collaborative and across borders. Uh, so there are um, stories embedded in textiles that we, on the one hand, the capacity of these stories we use as a pedagogical tool in classes, for example, that I teach at MIT or other places, where students uh, research uh, textile traditions from different cultures to familiarize themselves with what they perceive or might be perceiving as an alien culture or an enemy. Um, to discover what they share. On the other hand, maybe for other students, it's about, like for this Palestinian student, um, talking about their own um, history of migration and healing through that process of making. Two other types of productions where we infiltrate ourselves in uh, different educational systems in the camps, like in Zatari, uh, where we worked with NRC to bringing the cultural component into the um, um, labor education um, workshops where you know, women learn sewing for kind of cheap labor in factories, but how can one subvert that and maybe bring in those tools uh, where they can also uh, use the skills that they learn for self-expression, self-determination, and also to um, alter their living environments. So all of these different stories and their different outputs of this project, um, you know, the, what you see in the exhibition is not produced by refugees. Um, uh, those stay with their makers, uh, but uh, what is shared between and across borders are the stories and depictions uh, of, of uh, different makers. I would like to conclude with this slide that for me, you know, I come from Bosnia and Herzegovina and um, I would like to comment on the kind of notions of, of preservation more broadly through craft. Um, you know, we had this famous bridge that was destroyed in Mostar um, and um, restored in 2004 with meticulous attention to craftsmanship and restoring it exactly how it was initially built. But the uh, coexistence in this city hasn't been restored. And here, you know, I would like us to leave with the question of what exactly is being restored and what, to what end. And um, can that material dimension and craftsmanship also be used to further uh, social reconstruction and counter some of these political problems that we're experiencing around um, presence and creation of refugees around the world? Thank you. Thank you. Um...
we're happy to be here in this uh, meetings on architecture. Uh, maybe we'll load the, yeah. So uh, we tried to put together um, small notes that maybe put together, perhaps speak about uh, crafting architecture. So um, we'll start by this project. Um, in 2017, we were invited to submit a design for a gifted student school. Uh, the site we were working on was beautiful, uh, quite steep, uh, and overlooking a beautiful view in uh, Ramallah. Um, uh, our project is uh, inspired by uh, the hairpin road systems that climb up topographies following their contour lines. Um, while avoiding to spoil the landscape by digging the land, we have worked on a hairpin turn shaped building that creates interstitial planted spaces while the single story building uh, snakes through the entire site with a smooth ramp. Um, the, the project was immediately and instantly rejected for the simple reason that the investor wouldn't be able to fundraise for a project that has no distinct separate buildings on which donation plates could be installed. And so we uh, realized here that funds shape architecture, that the economic system shapes the building, that the city is no longer planned by architects, but by investors. The city belongs to real estate investors. So basically, the second note is about um, rules and opportunities in, in, uh, in the the context of Palestine, uh, in the context of creating architecture in Palestine. So in Palestine, buildings built before, the 19, before 1917 are protected. However, all the modern architecture heritage is being disregarded as an architectural heritage and replaced by economically uh, motivated commercial investments. Whether this trend is good or bad is not really the question. In Palestine, the absence of framework in architecture is both an opportunity an opportunity and an immense chaos creator. As architects, we can experiment, uh, build more easily than in many other places in the world, thanks to the absence of this framework. But these are the exact same reasons why an investor is able to destroy a heritage fueled building to replace it with a commercial center. We play by the same rules, yet we take the absence of framework as a tool in the process of making architecture. In 2019, we worked on uh, Amud. Uh, it's a stone column made out of, a collect of collected stone architectural ruins from various illegally demolished stone buildings. The different stone elements come from different periods and illustrate different techniques of construction. It addresses the question of the possibilities of reusing stone as a structural material, as well as the finite resource that it embodies and its direct consequent uh, and effect on the natural landscape. On a more global note, um, the approach seeks to integrate salvage stone building components in contemporary architecture. The stones collected were geometrically analyzed and interfaces based on our, actu on our actual stereotomy research allowed us to create a self-standing massive stone column. Under the actual state of the research, we are trying to look at the reuse of stone elements and their adaptations to new forms and configurations as structural elements of architecture. This uh, third note is called Artisan Heroes. Uh, we were always impressed how crafted elements of architecture combined at a building scale can have an impact on the built environment. Artisans have a role to play in the architectural landscape. Uh, unfortunately, today, most of the designers are interested in the illusion of uh, saving the crafts and in a sort of nostalgic vision of artisanal works. But interestingly enough, most of the designers aiming at saving artisans tend to work in countries of the Global South. However, the artisanship disregard is not only true in the Global South, um, not only in the global south, and the imperialist uh, nostalgia that is used to pretend that saving craft is more of a selfish, useless approach to design. <laughs> 
uh, no artisans are to be saved and even less by designers. However, celebrating artisanship is a whole different perspective. Uh, celebrating crafts make use of contemporary skills of artisans for the production of design and or architecture in a contemporary modern context. Crafting the city with artisans such as uh, such is such an enrichment of our knowledge of the city and its materials. In 2018, we've been invited to participate in a competition for building, for building a tourist village in the surroundings of Bethlehem. The brief basically stated that it's no longer needed for pilgrims to visit Bethlehem, but rather visit a village where Bethlehem's authentic atmosphere was copied. In fact, the project brief uh, is what uh, Renato Rosaldo would call imperialist nostalgia, with the small difference that the piece writers are those same persons who have been colonized. Heritage, and in particular architectural heritage, has become Western contemporary appreciation of local cultures and traditions. It freezes architecture in a state of musified objects, of illusional qualities, and de facto gives it a folkloric value. How many times have we associated Arab architecture as if all Arab architectures are identical with musharabiyas and domes? In an, in an attempt of escaping the initial romantic, folkloric, and nostalgic brief of the, comp of the competition we lost, our project extracts peculiar characteristics of identified Palestinian urban space typologies um, and magn magnify them as trans transcendental elements of, uh, of architecture. This uh, fifth note is called Global versus Local. Global and local knowledge are usually opposed as two separate systems of integration within particular contexts. This church in France has been built several years after the building of Saint Anne Church in Jerusalem, yet they, sh they uh, share very similar construction techniques. The one that you see on the left is the church in Saint Anne, Saint Anne in Jerusalem, and the one on the right is in uh, France, in the region of the Aquitaine. It's called l'Abbaye de Beauchot. And it is very probable that the Crusaders uh, exported techniques that they had learned in Jerusalem to build the church in France. So both of them were built by the Crusaders, both with the same uh, construction techniques, but the one in Jerusalem was built probably uh, right before the one in France. So, uh, and, and we know that the one built in Jerusalem was built with specific techniques that they found uh, in, in situ. So, um, this turns the whole uh, uh, system upside down, where actually it's, um, the techniques are not um, sort of uh, um, imported uh, techniques, but they're shared techniques that, uh, are, uh, uh, that, that travel along with the civilizations. This question, uh, this question is the unilateral transmission of know-hows versus a constant exchange of know-hows. It questions the local and global uh, exchange of techniques and traces unseen analogies between architectural forms across borders. Through time, certain architectural uh, attributes originally found locally returned to Palestine as important architectural elements. In an attempt to blur the limits between local and global architecture, our project Stone Matters puts forward the relevance of its content beyond space and time. Um, in the V&A, uh, the Victorian, uh, Victorian Albert Museum in London, the cast room is made of one of two one replicas of Italian Renaissance sculptures. They were, at the time, where traveling was very costly, used to give access to a wider audience of contemporary art. The international expo events were set to share advances in different realms of different countries in the world. In a world where technology allowed a high level of far distance communications, what are these, type, what are these types of events made for? In March 2020, at the beginning of the pandemic, we started, we launched uh, Radio Al-Hara, which is very similar to the way we, um, uh, our practice of architecture is, articulates the idea of crafts. Where, where, the, where we perceive crafts as a, as a way to work in, a com on, in community. Uh, 
uh, and how uh, the degree of communality is integrated in, a, in the architectural process. Paradoxically, in a world where communication has been extensively developed, inequalities, injustices, social disparities, racism, and extremism are increasing on a daily basis. Tracing rooted cultural links between architectural elements, using salvage stone for architecture, or refusing any bullshit cultural domination discourse are as many reasons that pushed us to create this um, radio. So Radio Hara is based in between Bethlehem, Ramallah, and Amman. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a radio that hosts uh, musical sets, conversation, recordings, discussions, and its main aim is to blend uh, the limits between producers and listeners. Uh, we had the opportunity to have one of the events of uh, the radio under the structure here in Venice, where at the, um, the day of the opening of, uh, of the Venice Biennale, there was this uh, war that was happening um, in Jerusalem and in Gaza. And at, the, at that very specific moment, we really didn't know how to react um, uh, with the programmation that we had uh, in the radio, so we decided to shut down the radio for a certain number of hours and uh, post an open call where uh, we made the uh, waves um, accessible to anyone that wanted to show any form of solidarity with Palestine, but as well to open the waves to uh, try to create uh, transversality in between different forms of oppression and injustices that are happening in the world. Um, yeah, so, th so this brings us to um, all purpose. Um, our contribution for the Venice Biennale. And it's basically a project that uh, allowed us to investigate the, um, how the uh, use of stone as a structural component in architecture can create new forms of architecture, new typologies of uh, architecture, and how it can adapt, for example, in that format to a household, and how a structure can be reverberated on the floor plan to create a very specific uh, typology of uh, of a house. Uh, all of these uh, notes put together for us speak about the uh, crafting architecture because they all uh, um, speak about the relation between the techniques or in between the way of crafting material and uh, the relation with the context. So the all-purpose uh, project presented at the Venice Biennale is uh, uh, the latest project of Stone Matters, which is a research project on stone construction and is the um, it's the, the, the project from the beginning of um, Stone Matters. Uh, the project were very much into uh, stone construction techniques um, uh, with the uh, stone construction know-hows, etc. And as, as we went with this research, the projects went uh, having more and more relation to the context, to, to basically architecture. And for us, crafting architecture is not only speaking about the crafts or saving the crafts or speaking about folkloric uh, crafts, but is mainly about uh, uh, creating the link or the relation in between the techniques and the, and, and the space and architecture. And the project presented here is a sort of an attempt to um, create a space that is architecturally uh, organized under a structure that works uh, as, a, as a structural stone um, uh, uh, roof. So the, the structure is made out of several domes that can represent here uh, at the Venice Biennale in a sort of an abstract scale, uh, can represent uh, several rooms of a household. And the spaces in between those domes are uh, interstitial spaces that are common spaces in between those uh, elements. And the, the idea is how the uh, construction techniques reflect an organizational uh, plan uh, that creates uh, an architectural space. So how crafts are linked to space. Yeah. Just a quick note on, uh, before, to, before ending, on local industries. Uh, local industries is a network of uh, industrial design production that we launched in Bethlehem in 2012. And it was uh, a result of a competition that we won. Uh, it was a music uh, conservatory that we built. And at the end of the construction process, the money that was allocated to the, to the furniture totally vanished. I mean, disappeared. Not disappeared because of, uh, I mean, because of fluctuation of currency. Uh, 
So we have to look into opportunities on developing the furniture of the building within uh, a very limited budget and working very closely with the artisans involved in the construction of, uh, of the building. Uh, and basically it ended up being uh, way more interesting than working on the architecture of the building itself. So we decided to maintain this network that is today a constantly evolving network of uh, industrial, industrial making. It's not essentially, it's not only furniture, but it's as well a network that's allowing us to work with artisans, to pr to, with artisans and artists to produce, um, to, to, uh, to produce art pieces or, um, or furniture. Thank you. What's amazing about this panel is that it has taken us from the discussions we had earlier, especially with the first panel on the idea of cultural mobility, to uh, something that is more like mobile cultures through the way that you interpret craft and uh, its interpretations. I had an Armenian uncle by marriage, Uncle Johannes, who was a very good tanner. And I once asked him, why is it that Armenians in Lebanon uh, are always good with music or with craft? And he answered, he said, you know, those of us who managed to make it out, uh, made it out without our property or without our money, and all we had and all we could live on is our craft, our skills. And therefore, there's a kind of very intimate association between the respect and holding on to craft and refugees. Uh, it explained to me many things about my classmates, my friends who are Armenian, and how they valued uh, craft, but also how the education of craft was a very important dimension of their lives. All of you did stress that, the importance of education in the transmission of craft, and how that is different, I want to ask you, from other forms of education. I ask it to you, Azra, in terms of its relation to art, I ask it to you, George, in terms of its relation to many other areas of education that you've invested in, and I ask it to you in terms of the difference between teaching craft or teaching architecture, or learning craft and learning architecture. I'm going to download all my questions at once, and then you choose whichever one you want. Uh, I also want to ask the same question to all of you about the notion of dignity. Uh, you talked about mental health and uh, well-being, social well-being. But also, somehow, craft is related to restoring dignity. Probably people in crisis like refugees being uprooted, uh, living in places which are not theirs, being considered outsiders, uh, have a certain problem with self-esteem. And in all of the cases that you described, there's a sense that craft restores a level of dignity to people. I want to ask you about that. Uh, I also want to ask you about the kinds of tensions that I inevitably emerge with craft. Uh, without repeating the four-letter word that you used on your slide in relationship to folklore, you managed to get rid of that association between craft and folklore. So thank you for that. But uh, there are also associations with uh, craft that have to be discussed. One is the tension or contrast between craft and technology. And all of you managed to somehow straddle that elegantly, but I want to put it on the table to say, let's talk about that tension. There's another tension associated between craft and the new, that craft is usually associated with, with the old. Uh, but also with the notions of precision, and I think all of the examples that you presented somehow celebrated imprecision as being a, a malleable, flexible approach to technology. I, I want to ask you to spend some time on that. And then the other dimension, which is craft as being a form of scavenging, where we collect leftovers and do something with them. You called it upcycling. Uh, so I, I also want to dwell on that a little bit. You choose whichever way you want to answer, and we start with George, because we started with George. Thank, well, I think thank you. Um, well, I would first of all query the premise that there is such a thing as craft. And we tend to try to take a more holistic view of 
uh, craft and art and other forms of artistic expression. And I think there's a tendency to segment um, artistic expression between craft and, and, and art or design and, and many other sort of subdivisions and segmentations. And I think that can actually be unhelpful. To your questions about, for example, education and um, technology and more broadly around, around health, the subject that I was focused on, I think that there's, if we think in the round, in this holistic way, we can see that teaching craft, to use that, that, that formulation, is actually a way of teaching about the world, about nature, about precision, about technologies, about history, about the future, and all these different uh, pieces of the puzzle sort of fall into place. And, and craft uh, teaching is a useful way of tackling these questions. But I would always um, promote the, the, the approach of trying to eradicate or at least um, de-emphasizing that distinction between craft on the one hand and art and other forms of, of, of artistic expression on the other. And in fact, Professor, in your um, anecdote of your uncle through, through marriage, you said, um, why is it that Armenians are so good at craft and music? And again, I think that's, uh, you know, to, to, to start to erode those distinctions, I think is, is important. Thank you. I'll start with the restoring dignity. I think this was one of the most powerful uh, lessons that we learned from these uh, places is, you know, how do people deal with situations of existential threat? And, and where, I mean, in Bosnia, people were making things, they're making uh, flower vases out of uh, grenade shells that were three million fired on the city of Sarajevo during the, the siege, right? And for me, it was a kind of, perverse uh, type of product when I first saw it, but it's actually genius. The way of, in which people use um, their skill and their craft to subvert and transform these objects of death into objects of beauty and a kind of restore dignity to life in places that deprive them of these very essential um, you know, needs. And in the camps, uh, it's, it's the same thing, uh, people use craft and whatever they can to, um, to claim agency in a place that deprives them of any kind of agency. You are just a number who arrives somewhere, you get your shed, you get your blanket, you get your cookerware, and that's it, right? You don't have any other needs. And by creating and doing things and these different designs, it's a, it's a tool to um, create a dignified life. And I think it's quite... Um, powerful, it's, it's, a, it's a tool of empowerment, let's say. Uh, and it's so interesting to see, speaking of technology, right, and, and these tensions. In the camps, for example, it's very difficult to bring in any kind of technology. Uh, laptops are, computers are registered, everything is really going in a specific process. If you wanted to, you know, many people wanted to do fab labs and this kind of make, uh, make laboratories in camps. That has been met with suspicion because, my God, maybe they will be producing weapons out of that, right? But thinking about craft as this vehicle of, of, uh, of power and, and, and reclaiming agency, uh, that's somehow seen as not powerful enough, right? And, and that's interesting tension to me because uh, what this man did with the sandcastle is much more powerful than laser cutting some keychain and in a, some kind of fab lab, right? in terms of uh, what it does uh, to, to survival of that person. Yeah, I'll leave it uh, for now at this, uh, and we'll connect to other questions later. I'll maybe just reflect on the idea of, uh, there was always this idea of, tech you mentioned this idea of technology and craft, and uh, always the parallel that is made in between uh, technology and craft where basically we, we were working with technology because we can achieve results that cannot be uh, attained without uh, using the technology. But craft is, is always central because uh, we use technology as a tool, uh, like uh, historically we had specific tools to create very uh, uh, sophisticated stereotomies or ways of cutting stones to assemble them in a very particular way. 
but technology is only used as something that uh, allows us to gain time and to be more precise. Um, and and what we're really interested in is the idea that crafts, uh, craft basically using craft in architecture is um, a new formulation in creating cities that are more um, adapted to very local conditions and very local um, construction techniques and to link, to create very strong links in between uh, space morphology and crafts. So going from the scale of looking at how things are assembled and how this creates portions of cities that are more adapted to very specific conditions of living. Um, yeah, uh, I would just add that uh, maybe the craft is really linked, in our case at least, uh, to scale. Uh, I mean, in, in, in Palestine, the uh, the limits of cities are, uh, are are not really defined because of the uh, the occupation situation. So the limits are are the limits of a city are not defined, or at least the limits of the city are the places where lands uh, are being uh, threatened of being expropriated. So de facto, we are uh, forced to work with crafts because the the scale then reduces to uh, instead of having to think the city as. Uh, as, as, as a master plan, for example, we, we think it as uh, small uh, entities that work one with, with the other on a, in a very um, evolving way. So, so, so when we reduce the scale of uh, thinking the city, we immediately start uh, working with crafts instead of, uh, I mean, the, the, the scale, reducing the scale forces us to work more with crafts and in a certain way preserve uh, crafts. But this is basically, I mean, this is within the current condition, political conditions where the cities are not defined according to a master plan like any other part of the world because we have no master plans and because uh, no one recognizes the, the actual uh, contested uh, territories. But actually, if we look at the historic architecture of Palestinian cities or, or throughout the region, we would see a direct link in between um, the forms of architecture and the general morphology and urban form of the city. The, that's, I mean, that's one of uh, the core of uh, that's one of the core elements of the research that we're trying to work on. It just dawned on me as we were discussing education in relation to craft that in Arabic we refer to the craftsman on site as being the ma'allim, who's which means also educator. Uh, so the skilled laborer on site is called the teacher. Uh, it's a very interesting uh, use of the word, which means both skilled, but also transmitter of the skill. And it brings me to another question I failed to list earlier, which has to do with uh, the placement of craftsmanship and crafts in the hierarchy of economies and hierarchies of labor. If you look at the construction site and the hierarchies there, both in terms of pay, uh, standing, etc. There's first the unskilled labor, and then in the middle is the skilled labor, and then on top there's the designer, uh, manager, etc. The unskilled labor and the designer share with each other one thing, that they are generalists. But the craftsmen are usually specialists. And uh, they have a very different place in the hierarchy, and they are usually uh, people who move from one side to the other after their labor is done, because they are needed only for a specific period of time. So they are much more mobile in their connection to the construction site than the others. The others tend to stay more. So I wanted to ask you, in your experiences working with craftsmen and craftswomen, uh, whether they have that nimbleness, mobility, and association with a particular class within the hierarchy, or you see the skilling of labor, therefore acquiring of craft, as being a form of enabling and raising in rank. Well, I can say maybe for the in the Jordanian uh, refugee camps, it's certainly uh, like skilling uh, and, and, and learning a certain craft is a form of social mobility in some way. Because it is a context where, um, in camps, uh, access to education is limited, right? So uh, even though it's provided, but uh, spaces for education are limited, and also times, and you have a huge amount of population, everyone in, with the same needs. Um, 
So the, the transmission of knowledge in an informal way that goes within, you know, between different generations and within the community is one form, but also the, the skilling that is formal skilling of labor for the market, let's say, is another one. And in a place where, you know, you cannot study whatever you want and find a job, it's quite limited because it starts competing with the local um, access for Jordanians, let's say. Uh, so you cannot just, uh, as a Syrian refugee, choose to study whatever you want. So craftsmanship in some way is one avenue in which you could potentially build yourself a future if you have um, labor. But of course, those possibilities are also limited because you know, training, um, the livelihood training happens also for specific market niches, which in the context of textile industry are quite exploitative. And this not only in the camps, I mean, we're talking here about like the global uh, condition of exploitation and oppression. I, I, I would say yes, I think that there are these hierarchies, um, even within crafts, as you said, you know, there's the carpenter, the joiner, the cabinet maker, the furniture maker, at each level, uh, higher economic um, opportunity. But what I find very interesting also is that even in the face of tremendous economic headwinds for artisanship, because of technology in many cases, um, uh, I think it was Rashad was talking about the emergence of plastic replacing rural production methods. There is sort of in parallel this emerging cultural value being placed on crafts that might not once have existed in the same way in that the traditional crafts uh, are, are now perceived to have a deeper significance, almost a sort of mythical, identity-based significance within a, within a community, within a country, which perhaps never existed before, and is taking those, putting those crafts into new places in the sort of the value chain and our understanding of where value lies. Um, that can have negative uh, consequences, I think, because when culture starts to be so closely uh, affiliated with identity, it can be corrupted and used for political purposes uh, rather than you know, purely artistic ones, uh, for good or for ill. Um, but this is, I think, an, an emerging uh, reconfiguration of the cultural map and the way that value is described, not purely economically, but also this idea of cultural value. Yeah, uh, um, there's this story about, uh, maybe this is more specific to stonemasons, but there's this story about uh, a stonemason called uh, Ali Safadi from the village of Safad in Palestine that used to uh, bring stones on his uh, donkey and go to construction sites kilometers away from his uh, hometown. And people would believe in this uh, particular stonemason because he, he had this uh, skilled uh, knowledge. And actually, the, this, uh, this, this kind of um, uh, attitude has disappeared. I, I think it's always linked to global issues, but also to very specific issues. I mean, global issues in the change of uh, uh, architecture, uh, the operation of uh, reinforced concrete, steel, uh, the separation between the facade and the roof, um, but also to very specific uh, uh, stories about stone in Palestine. I mean, the the first time we started using uh, cladding as, 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 as something to do with architecture, but also with the uh, political situation. And because we started uh, using uh, clad stone, all of those stonemasons started disappearing, and the uh, skills with it started disappearing. So the, uh, um, the way of, uh, I mean, the, the, the skilled uh, artisans became less and less important, uh, in relation also with the uh, social and political uh, context that is uh, actually the, the, um, the core of this uh, research we're doing on stone, which links uh, the use of the material to architecture, but also to its uh, immediate uh, context uh, of uh, reclaiming uh, territories through the use of material. So that, that's the, I mean, what Elias was saying about uh, linking uh, construction techniques to uh, more architectural morphologies and uh, city uh, fabrics. This is actually a very beautiful way to end a great day. <laughs>
thank you all for being part of it. I know that there are hundreds of people online, on Zoom, somewhere uh, watching us, so thank you all for uh, participating virtually. Unfortunately, you will not be able to join us for drinks, but please all join us for drinks after this. Cheers. Thank you.